Good evening and welcome to the San Bernardino City Council meeting of October the 22nd. I'd like to thank the Garden Club for providing an arrangement. Uh, calling this meeting to order. If I may have roll call, please. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Medina? Here. Councilmember Salazar? Here. Vice Mayor O'Connell? Here. Mayor Medina? Here. Uh, public comments for items that are not on the agenda. Please. That are not on the agenda. Pledge of allegiance. Oh, oh, the thank you, everybody. <laughs> I, I was like, okay, everybody else got it but Rico. So, why don't we all rise? Let's say the pledge. And I'm going to ask Chris Gonzalez if she can lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you to everyone keeping me on track. Now, let's go to public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Chris Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, I just had a fundraiser a couple weeks ago for a nonprofit that I'm a part of, um, Cake for Kids. We are a nonprofit that make cakes for foster children and at-risk youth, and we're in 10 counties in California. And we're trying to um, get awareness out in San Mateo County. So we had a fundraiser and so many people in this room were there, they contributed and the fundraiser was such a great success. So I just wanted to publicly thank everybody for their support. Um, and it's my goal this time next year to be more connected with the, um, all the departments in San Mateo County. So thank you all for your support. Thank you for your comments, Chris. Thank you for your efforts in, in that endeavor. Next, please. Paul Wapensky. Mr. Wapensky. Good evening. Thanks for letting me uh, speak. First off, I'd like to thank our police and firefighters for uh, keeping us safe every day. Um, I'm opposed to the increase in the sales tax ballot measure. Um, I received three of these flyers from the city. Whoops. That's right. Um, and it, they say that they're for local services and street repair. Um, but how much do these cost to send out? And it seemed more like they're a campaign ad than, uh, than information that should uh, be put out there. And, and there's nothing else that's on the ballot that's on there. It's just Measure G. So I, I kind of think that's on the verge of being unethical because it's not, I, I think it's something that, that shouldn't, we shouldn't have spent public money to send this out. It should be clear on the ballot. It also says that it'll raise approximately $4 million but according to the city's uh, information on the website, that's all, uh, we need uh, 16 to 20 to be at 80%. So it's really not gonna help out. Also, uh, what's the backup plan if it fails? Everybody that I've spoken to uh, is not in favor of it. Uh, at, the council, at the candidate uh, forum, uh, Councilwoman uh, O'Donnell, excuse me, Vice Mayor uh, O'Connell said that it amounts to about $20 per person. But everything keeps going up, property tax, uh, ballot measures for parcel taxes, garbage, water fees, gas closing in five bucks. Um, you know, all that adds on to that $20. So it's not just $20. Uh, every dollar that, that you spend uh, comes out of our pockets. My pockets got the feds, the state, the county, and your all's hands in it. Uh, there's no more room for the people. Um, you know, we can't just go to our employers or Social Security and ask for more money to spend so it's, that we can spend more money on taxes. Um, and I, I'm opposed to it. Um, the second thing is, uh, I was reading the, uh, the budget or the grand jury report and a response to F26 says that while the tax measure isn't targeted to address pension or personnel costs, should it be adopted, voters may be used uh, for any municipal or government purpose. So I sincerely hope that if this does pass, that we don't use that money uh, for other purposes that um, don't include street paving. Um, the last, or also, uh, according to the documents on the website, it says that the pension costs for CalPERS increased 11% last year, and they keep forecasting to go up, but I couldn't find anything in there that addresses any mitigation for those. So I just hope, hope somebody or the, or the staff or the city council is working on a plan to make uh, that uh, those, keep those skyrocketing costs uh, from going up uh, if they're funded. 
the last thing, I have two comments on the uh, agenda that comes out. Go ahead and finish up. If okay, you could. Uh, I'll make it quick. Thank you. Can we can we put like a a paragraph that has plain language, non-government speak of what the agenda item or the uh, ballot measure or not ballot measure, but the agenda item is, so that it makes it clear. I don't have to read 437 pages of documentation to figure out what's going on with it. And the second thing is, um, on the ballot or the uh, agenda, it always says approve. It never says discuss or approve, disapprove. So it seems like it's a foregone conclusion that whatever is presented is going to get passed. And I think that's something that we got to look at. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I've been asked if the vice mayor would like to uh, make a comment. Oh, I, I just like to make a clarification. I did reference twenty dollars, but. The, uh, what me, I meant was for $20 of taxable items, which is not food and not prescription drugs, this measure would add 10 cents to the tax. So that's why I said what I said. Do we have other speakers? Tom Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton. Uh, good evening. I just want to take a, a moment to um, say thank you to Council Member Salazar and Council Member Davis for hosting the, their Meet the Candidate event um, this past weekend. Uh, it was well attended, very well executed. Um, I really did appreciate it. It was, wasn't a one-on-one -on -one with each of them. It was a big, round, a big round circle where everyone presented their ideas and we had one long discussion about many, many topics facing the city uh, all together and it was really well done. Uh, so well done that I would... Um, I'm here to suggest that it become a regular event. Maybe it's some, something you know uh, that a rotating pair of uh, council members and the mayor could participate in each month, so that it wouldn't be a uh, too much of a burden uh, for any one person every month. Because I know you guys um, give a lot of your time already. So I wanted to make that suggestion. Um, one thing that struck me uh, during this discussion was that. There seems to be, a, well, there isn't, doesn't seem to be, there is a divide in, here in San Bruno, and that's been kind of pushed open a little wider by, the, by this election. And in talking with folks and having discussions like the one we had on Saturday, um, it's clear that about 90% of what we talk about, everybody agrees on. We all want better streets. We all want a better downtown. We all want to support our local businesses and, and all these going you know, on and on and on. And what seems to be happening is that we're focusing on that 10% and a lot of energy goes into that 10% and to push us all apart. And what I'm hoping for, and I'm hoping that everyone listening, when this election is over, we all need to still live here together. And regardless of the outcome of the election, I hope that we can all focus on that 90% and build on that and move forward together. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Tom. Okay, I'm showing no other speaker cards. Is there anybody in the audience that wanted to speak on an item that is not on the agenda? If not, we will go ahead and move on to announcements. Item A, Melissa. Vote by mail ballots were mailed to all registered voters in San Mateo County on October 7th. Replacement ballots will be mailed through Tuesday, October 29th. To receive a replacement ballot, please contact my office at 616 7070. Also, there are three voting centers that will be servicing the city of San Bruno. Skyline College serves as an 11 day voting center and will be open to voters starting October 26, 2019 through Election Day. San Bruno City Hall and the Senior Center are four day voting centers and will be open to voters starting November 1st through Election Day. Okay, next we have uh, some up. Yes. Can I just ask a clarification on that comment? Of course. When you say that these voting centers are open, are you walking in without a ballot or do you need to have your ballot on those voting centers? Both. You can, if you don't have a ballot with you, you can come in because there will be employees from the county here to assist you if you need a ballot. Um, if you need to register to vote, they can assist for that as well. Okay, next we have some uh, under item B, some upcoming special events. Joanne. Thank you. Happening at the library this month on October 25th, a weekly parent and child bilingual activity group begins. And October 26th, adults can decorate sugar skulls for Dia de los Muertos. And the library will host a special Diwali Festival of Light family story time October 28th. 
for Halloween fun. Join us on October 24th for the 24th annual Goblin Grotto event at the Rec Center Gymnasium on October 31st. The San Bruno Chamber of Commerce will sponsor story time at the Bay Area Entrepreneur Center located at 458 San Mateo Avenue and immediately following, following enjoy trick or treat on the avenue. Also that day, the Recreation Department will sponsor the Halloween happening event at Tan Foran Mall. In City Park, the Culture and Arts Commission invites you to Shakespeare in the Park at Rotary Pavilion at City Park on October 27th. And the Recreation Department will also be hosting a mother-son kickball event at City Park on Saturday, November 3rd with a picnic to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, next on the agenda will be a proclamation celebrating and proclaiming October 23rd through the 31st as Red Ribbon Week. Um, I'm not going to read all the whereas as the chief can go into more detail, but as you know, it used to be uh, noted as Red Ribbon, all, always around the Halloween time. Probably started back with Nancy Reagan when it was just say no. And this is something that has been important that the community celebrated, and now we're stepping it up with uh, wristbands as well. So the council has theirs, staff has theirs to lead by example as it begins tomorrow. So whereas all of those who reside, work, and frequent the city of San Bruno are encouraged to demonstrate their commitment to healthy, drug-free lifestyles by wearing wristbands, commemorating, commemorating gosh, Red Ribbon Week, and whereas the city of San Bruno community further commits to contributing to the success of Red Ribbon Week. Now, therefore, I, Rico E. Medina, mayor of the city of San Bruno, and on behalf of our entire city council, proclaim October 23rd, 2019 through October 31st, uh, 2019 as Red Ribbon Week, and we encourage all participants uh, in the drug prevention education activities, not only during Red Ribbon Week, but also throughout the year, making a visible statement that we are strongly committed to a drug-free lifestyle. Chief Barberini. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council Members. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, uh, the city of San Bruno, uh, in conjunction with the state attorney general's office, the San Bruno School District, and many other civic-minded organizations have participated in Red Rib Ribbon Week since its, be, uh, since its beginning in 1985. Now, we often get a lot of questions, what's with the wet red ribbon and how did it, how did it begin? Um, so we thought we'd kind of give you a brief background and story on, on where that comes from. Um, Enrique Kiki Camarena was a drug enforcement agent uh, in the uh, mid-'80s. In 1985, he was killed in Mexico while working. Uh, Agent Camarena's um, mother had tried to talk him out of joining the DEA, um, and her, his response to her was, I'm only one person, but I want to make a difference. Uh, in honor of Agent Camarena's memory and his battle against illegal drug trafficking, friends and neighbors began to wear red satin badges. Groups of parents, frustrated with the destruction that alcohol and other drugs were causing in their communities, began forming drug awareness coalitions and looked to Agent Caramarana as a model and embraced his belief that one person can make a difference. These coalitions also adopted the symbol of Agent Caramarana's memory, the Red Ribbon. Today, the Red Ribbon serves as a catalyst to mobilize communities to educate youth and encourage participation in drug prevention activities. As the mayor mentioned, we've kind of evolved from the Red Ribbon to the uh, the, the Red Wristband to hopefully make it um, more, uh, more accessible and uh, and a little bit cooler for the kids to wear in the school district too. So we appreciate your support. On behalf of the police department, thank you for taking the time to recognize um, this week and its significance. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and thank you for the uh, background and information as to why we're uh, proclaiming that and celebrating that. Next, item D, receive annual presentation from the Culture and Arts Commission. Good evening. I, my name is Melody Tobin, with the Culture and Arts Commission. I'm here to present our annual report. I'm not doing that. I'm sharing this with you. <laughs> Melissa will do it.
So I have um, tonight with us is um, one of my fellow commission members, Judy Pacini, is here in the audience with us. Hi, Judy. I think Judy's the only other member here. But um, this year, our commission members, our chair is Pamela Gamble. Our vice chair is Melissa Rolfs. Our members are Jean George, Pamela Madden, Janet Mahan, yeah, Monahan, thank you, Judy Pacini and myself, Melody Tobin. The commission is responsible for promoting the artist development of the community and preserving San Bruno's diverse cultural heritage. The commission's goals including acquiring and maintaining public art as well as sponsoring programs and events that enhance the quality of life for the residents and improve the image and character of the community. The 2018-2019 accomplishments. We completed and installed artwork on three traffic signal controller boxes, which has been a long-term goal. We have selected uh, two more city-owned boxes for um, art. We replaced what we found out were state-owned boxes. We're getting ready to uh, move those into production. Again, we hosted Movies in the Park this year. We are getting ready to host Shakespeare in the Park, which is coming up this Sunday, 2 o'clock, in, uh, in front of the Rotary Pavilion. We're hosting Macbeth. We hosted the Library Art Gallery Program, which is an annual event. We sponsor the Children's Art Project in conjunction with the Posey Parade and the Community Day in the Park hosted the International Children's Art Exhibit from San Bruno's sister city, Narita, Japan. And in conjunction with the Parks and Recreation Commission, we created a subcommittee to study the art options for the new recreation and aquatics center. So this is uh, the 20, part of the 2018-2019 accomplishments. These are the three signal boxes that have been completed. From left to right, the Crystal Springs Road and Cunningham Way, which is right across the street from the Senior Center. You can see the um, little fox. It's kind of a uh, nature uh, themed box. Uh, the middle one, which is more of a um, centennial themed box, it's um, down in San Bruno Avenue and 3rd Avenue. And then the one on the right is in front of um, Hashes and Brew at, on Cherry Avenue and San Bruno Avenue. Another, so these are the three, uh, the second phase, two proposed, selected two of the city owned traffic signal controller boxes. These are the next ones. The locations are on um, Sneath Lane and Seabiscuit Avenue across from Tan Foran kind of right in front of Beverages and More. And then San Mateo Avenue and Huntington Avenue, which is right by the Caltrain station. And then the next one is Sharp Park Road and Pacific Heights, which is the third one we're going to do in the second phase, um, which is a, a city owned box. So our movies in the park this year were Bumblebee, Mary Poppins Returns. Yeah, I can't read that one. Captain Marvel, and then uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet. Now, was it Breaks the Internet? Yep. Yeah, Ralph Breaks the Internet. And then, as I said, this coming Sunday is Shakespeare in the Park. It's Macbeth. Again, it's 2 o'clock in um, the city park in front of the Rotary Pavilion. The weather is supposed to be beautiful, so everybody come out. Bring a chair, bring a picnic lunch, bring whatever you want to be comfortable and have a good afternoon. It's about an hour presentation and it's usually a lot of fun. There's a lot of audience participation and it's a great family event. Uh, this is the library art program and these are three of the, uh, just a selection, three of the um, artist representations that we are hanging in the gallery this year. Sponsored our children's art project, so this is just a representation of the art that we did in conjunction with the Posey Parade and the Community Day in the Park back in June. 
and then the uh, children's art exhibit from Narita. And um, just to let you know that the, we're working with the Parks and Recs for the new Aquatic Center to bring in some art and something interesting and exciting for the new uh, Aquatic Center. So our goals for 2019 and 2020, to let you know what our city art fund balance is as of September 2019 is $306,301. We plan to continue to work with the Park and Rec Commission to establish a significant art presence in the new Rec and Aquatic Center. We are working to relocate the recognition sculpture to the current location will be within the footprint of the new Rec and Aquatic Center. We are plan to continue the gallery exhibit program in the library. We will continue to host uh, the 2020 Narita International Children's Exhibit artwork in the library. We will continue to present the movies in the park and we will continue to present the Shakespeare in the park. Complete the remaining three traffic signal art boxes. We'll sponsor the children's art project in conjunction with the Posey Parade and the Community Day in the park. We are going to create an interactive art map demonstrating the location of the Culture and Arts commissioned art that we have so far in the city. And we're going to continue to develop the commission's vision for future art projects within the city of San Bruno. We'd like to recognize that uh, this year we lost one of our former commission members, Barty Rossman Kudrin, who passed away on June 15th. She was a member uh, for 10 years on our commission. And then we also in June dedicated a uh, plaque on the memorial sculpture to Carolyn Livingood, who was a recognized for 25 years of extraordinary service to the city of San Bruno. And she was one of the inaugural members of the Culture and Arts Commission. And that concludes our annual report. Let's see, I got through that. I didn't know if I was going to be able to get through Barty and Carolyn. Uh, you did well. Those were difficult ones for me. Any you, comments or questions? Uh, yes, do you have any questions? Uh, I have. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for your work and the rest of the commissioners. I know it's not easy, and sometimes it can be a long and arduous journey to get from the first concept of something to a final. Uh, presentation of it. I know especially the control boxes, I think it took you eight years, ten years from when we first proposed it to finally getting it to where it is. And Our biggest know. regret is that neither Barty nor Carolyn got to see it. Yes, and they, I know they were part of it. They were apart from the very beginning. But you've done it and you're <laughs> continuing to do it, so they that's have, fabulous. They have the best view, hopefully. So that, that's something I know, I've had heard many comments from many people, especially the one at, uh, you know, the, the people who view the most over the heart one at uh, Bay, Hill. Bay Hill and Cherry. So um, thank you for all of that. I have a couple of comments. You have a very robust budget and um, I think it's fantastic and I think it's very uh, far reaching of you to think of what to do for the aquatics center, but maybe I mean, that's going to be three years, maybe longer, and you'll still be collecting money all those years too. So maybe there's a way to do a budget to say, we're going to do X amount of money for this art for the aquatic center. And with the rest of the money, we need to look at other things because while that's going to be a beautiful facility, it is only in one place in San Bruno. And we have many places that need your tender, loving care. So I, I think, that would be something that would be beneficial to everybody. You know, sit down, make a decision about how much money you're going to put aside for that, and then take the rest and do some things. Because I have some suggestions. We know <laughs> so. that we are going to have to provide the money to relocate the memorial sculpture 100% mm -hmm. from our fund. So right now we are dedicating, and we're we're working. We're going to reach out to the artists that created the memorial sculpture to help us figure out how to move it, um, mm -hmm. help us find the perfect spot, hopefully within the city park, to move it to, um, and figure out the budget for that. So that that's our next allocation for money, and we're not sure whether that's going to be $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. 
that's our next chunk of money that we're going to, to allocate. And then after that, uh, we, we agree wholeheartedly that we need to allocate some money for another big project. And I, I feel that you're going to suggest something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to suggest several things. Okay. Um, and, and for the people who think I might be being a little pushy, I, I uh, was instrumental in starting the Culture and Arts Commission. It's kind of one of the things I'm very proud of and very proud that they have their own funding source. So yes, I'm, I'm going to get a little pushy. So, uh, and, and part of this is I cannot vote with the uh, streetscape plan, and I know part of the plan included the fountain at the, or defunct fountain at the train station. Um, so maybe in conjunction with that, the Art, Culture and Arts Commission can work on putting something beautiful there. Um, I've, I know that there are many opportunities, and I know that a xeriscape landscaping with some of the metal sculptures from Boris, and I always say Kudrin. his last name wrong. Kudrin. Thank you. Um, would be, I think would be fabulous, but that's a suggestion. I put another suggestion down there uh, on your, on the podium. I see that. Thank you. And it's, um, it's a fun one. It's, you know, people have been talking about a festival and why don't we do street fairs anymore and all those different things. And I came across this article about um, art on, on a, it's actually on a parking lot on this particular one. And they had, um, uh, they did a, a roller skate rink on top of it and it was, uh, they had a fabulous time and they've done a lot of things. Um, so this might be something to take to the commission and, and maybe with the uh, San Bruno Chamber and you know, get some partnerships going and do something like that. So those are my comments. And again, thank you very much. I know you've been, you know, you were in the very beginning and you've been hanging in there and getting things done. So, and then Judy, thank you too. I know you're one of the newer, well, not anymore, huh? <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> Um, but thank you, too. I, it can be a steep learning curve when you deal with government stuff. So thank you for hanging in there. Laura. To the chair, I just wanted to say thank you for brightening up the city, because I think that's what art does. And the spots that I've seen them, and I've seen them all, they look great. So uh, good work, and it's, it's a pleasure to see the art, because it makes me smile. Us, too. Marnie. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so they're great. When, when, when you see something like that, it just gives you just a few moments to say, wow, that's really cool. And, and bringing art to our downtown. I know, I know we're going to be talking about that. I'll have to recuse myself um, later. But um, having, a, having some additional art downtown would be uh, lovely. So thank you. Well, Michael's good. And then I will just recap to say, on behalf of the council, please convey back to the entire board. Uh, our thanks and appreciation for the volunteer um, and for having visions to things, but then to see them to fruition. And this was long talked about, but it's now done and it's continuing. And that's what we should honor in addition to uh, the two ladies that you acknowledged and honored at the end. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's. <laughs> Clapping's good. Uh, let's move on to consent. All items on the consent calendar are considered routine or implement an earlier council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion unless requested. So I know there are three items to have comments on, but not separate action. Right, F and G. F and G, and then I. Are there any other items that want to be pulled or want to be just commented on? I'd, I'd like to, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. I'd like to pull item K. For a separate vote? Yes, please. Okay. All right. And um, why don't we go ahead? We have F, G, and I. K, we will take separate. Bless you. Um, on G, it's a resolution accepting the Crystal Springs Road sewer replacement project as complete, authorizing the filing of notice of completion with the San Mateo County Recorder's Office and authorizing release of the construction contract retention in the amount of $162,028.49. And um, I think on these next two items, it was just a matter of staff to give a little more insight as to the project's con completion as well as uh, it came under budget. 
And so if we can have staff. Sure, uh, Javon Grogan, uh, city manager. I'll have Jimmy Tan, our, our public works director, give that presentation. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Director. Hi, good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. So you mentioned, is it item G or F that you would like? Um, the, some there's going to be F and G, okay. but we're on F for right now. Sure, so for item F, um, this is related to the upper core pressure regulating valve replacement project. Um, this is a regulating project, a regulating station is something that you know we, we use to reduce uh, high water pressure to low water pressure so that we can distribute normal pressure to the, uh, the houses. Um, we, went, we came to council back in December 2018 to award the construction contract to Casey Construction and um, for a budget of uh, $369,000. And you know, we completed the project, um, substantially completed in August uh, of 2019. And the total change orders amount was about close to about $21,000 in that project. Uh, we came under budget, as noted in the staff report, uh, for, um, let's see here, about $26,900 will be returned back to the, uh, the Water Enterprise Fund. And this project also wanted to mention that you know, we designed it in-house as well, because it's something that you know, we can easily do, and, and, um, and we did manage the construction management and inspection in-house as well, so we saved more, more money on this project. And I'm sorry, I threw you off by reading G, and I, I'm, so item F was the resolution accepting the Arbor Court pressure regulating valve replacement project as complete, authorizing the filing of notice of completion with the San Mateo County Recorder's Office and authorizing the release of the construction contract retention in the amount of 19498 Correct. 498 So we have the uh, F and G. Marty, did you want to say any additional on that? Um, it's just one of those things where, where um, I think it's really important for the public to, to help understand that when we put projects in our sewer and water system to improve our infrastructure, it costs money. And this is a case where I think uh, the, our staff definitely should take uh, some bigger credit and, and, and I think just having it on consent um, doesn't um, share um, with the public, because I don't think too many people are reading through our, our uh, through our agenda packet. So, um, thank you very much, and that's that goes for the next project, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, item I. Th thank you, Director Tan. Uh, was accept a resignation from Traffic and Safety Parking Committee member effective October third, two thousand nineteen, and direct the City Clerk to post a notice of vacancy in accordance with state law. So, for those. No, oh, uh, gosh, L. Oh, God, I'm not. You guys, you need, I need your help here more tonight. Or my glasses. Um, that's L. Is in Larry. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Could we um, go back to G? I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. Because G, G is, G is a big project. G, G is a 3.7 million dollar project that uh, came 660, 760 thousand dollars under budget. So. Thank you, Marty. Thank. You. Thank you. No, no. Thank you. Uh, um, good evening again. Um, in regards to the Crystal Springs, Crystal Springs Sewer Road replacement project, um, this project uh, consisted of replacing about 3,000 feet of sewer main pipelines from 8 to 24 inches in diameter, which started at the intersection of uh, Oak and, and um, Crystal Springs Road all the way to Cemetery Avenue and, and El Camino. Um, so it was really challenging. Um, we had a lot of utilities to cross along El Camino. Um, but we were able to complete this work uh, under budget. The original contract with KJ Woods construction was in the amount of $3.3 million, and we also had a contingency of, of about you know, $502,000 on this project. But you know, we were able to uh, work with the contractor on various uh, issues uh, related to the project, as well as um, there's some scope changes that were done uh, uh, you know, out in the field uh, in order to get the, uh, the pipeline uh, installed. So we came in budget uh, for this. We didn't have to use a contingency on this project. We have about you know, 761000 about $500 um, left over, which will be uh, returned back to the Wastewater Enterprise Fund. So um, yeah, this is you know, it's one of those projects that needed to be completed, cost money, but we were able to um, you know, make sure that we, we came in a budget on this. Thank you, Director Tan, on both those, and Marty, thank you for uh, having those acknowledged because I think it's important uh, for us and the staff. And then I know Michael, Laura, have comments. Okay, uh, through the chair, I, I just wanted to, uh, I, I couldn't resist adding on that 
none of these repairs could have been done without the fee increases that we reluctantly imposed. And as much as we regretted having to, to do that, um, clearly there is a benefit to doing it and clearly we're accomplishing important work that was uh, absolutely required. And the only way we could have done it was through those fee increases. So I just wanted to mention that. Laura. Excellent point, uh, Council Member Salazar. But I just want to kind of, uh, from a council member, to acknowledge that you know that was a complicated project uh, in a very busy neighborhood, um, a lot of traffic, uh, schools, and I just want to thank you for adjusting times, start times to accommodate the additional traffic and the need. And it just seemed, um, I live in the area, I go by that a lot, it just seemed to be a pretty smooth project. And so I want to thank the staff and uh, just to, for job well done. Thank you. Maybe convey, uh, convey that to the team as well as I did hear the communication uh, to the neighboring schools as well as to the residents was well done and it kept them uh, on track and updated as to the progress of the project. Thank you. Crystal Springs Road. Okay, now we're going to move on to L. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. That was, again, I'm going to reread it. Accept the resignation from the Traffic and Safety Parking Committee member effective October 3rd uh, this year and direct the clerk to post a notice of vacancies in accordance with state law. So John was on the TSPC Traffic Safety Parking Committee from before and needed to step aside, but yet came back and came back with his knowledge and wisdom and experience, which Tom will uh, attest to, and, um, and has helped us out and uh, has a great opportunity in his life. I, I reached out to him and called him on behalf of all of us to thank him for his uh, generosity in this time um, and that all that he gives to this community. He doesn't just do it on the TSPC. There's a lot of other things that he does for various service groups and for the community. And you could always count on him no matter what, um, he would be there. And so, and if you needed food and you needed barbecue and you needed this, you needed that, John would handle it. So we just are pulling this to acknowledge him, thank him, wish him the best in his future. And he reminded me that uh, he'll still be around. So um, he's, not, he's not out of our lives and you will see him in San Bruno again. Um, so why don't we go ahead with a motion to pass everything with the exception of K. Move to approve. Second. Motion made and seconded to approve all items but K. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Five vote voice. Now we're going to move on to K. Adopt a resolution waiving the encroachment permit fees, staff labor reimbursement fees, and insurance rider premium costs for the encroachment permit application for the Halloween road closure on Park Avenue and appropriating $412 from the general fund. Marty. Okay. Um, <laughs> let me first start by saying that I'm in full support of having this event occur and waiving the fees. Um, I've been going to uh, that location for the last couple years and it's fantastic. Having, having the street closed and where you can walk with your young child and feel safer that you could cross the street and not worry about incoming traffic. And, and that neighborhood does an incredible job to, to really liven up uh, the Halloween spirits. If I can leave it at that. Um, the reason why I'm pulling it is, is to understand for other um, organizations that are interested in how the fee waiver process works. Um, how can a neighborhood or organization, when they come up to do, wanting to do an event that would cost money, how does it work to where they could say, hey, we would like the city to waive the fees. So I just want to make it clear, I'm in total support of this, but I wanted to have the public to understand and myself to understand how does one get their fees waived if they have a, a fantastic project or idea. Is that something staff is prepared to discuss? Sure, sure. So um, discussing the full fee schedule uh, and the waiver process, um, we won't go into that, but w what is germane is why this is before the city council. So this is before the city council because our fee schedule process does not have a waiver provision uh, that grants the city manager or uh, department heads the ability 
to waive city fees uh, outside of an operational issue uh, or something that the city manager is addressing. And so this is a request of a neighborhood to have a uh, community event. And so uh, the process for that right now is to make a formal request of the governing body and, and so yourself to waive city fees uh, and requirements. And so that is why, that is why this item is uh, before you today. Um, when we take a look at our fee schedule uh, in early 2020, we can uh, talk about a, a formal process. A number of cities uh, that I'm familiar with through their annual budgeting process go through and say what programs or um, neighborhood events the city will subsidize and approve that through the budget process. And so if it's done through the budget process, it does not have to come on a one-off basis. Um, but aside from having that, uh, this, is the, this one came up and we did want to formally bring it to the governing body for your support. Good, I'm good with it. I mean, it's, it's a great event if you guys uh, can make it. Um, it's fantastic. And I would say just to go into the history, that this, this started a few years ago because uh, some folks in the neighborhood, because the streetlights were out. They were worried about the safety of the young people and vehicles. So that's how it started. It wasn't just a cordon off a street, it was done strategically to try to protect the youth that came up in Strohs, but there were no street lights. So as a safety element, then therefore that's how it established uh, back then. Then after obviously a period of time, street lights were working. So it has come forward to the neighborhood still wishing that, which is placed on one or two persons to go around and get everybody's approval, everybody's signature within the neighborhood. Make sure everybody's on the same page because it means you don't get in, you don't get out of your house. So um, there are many steps that have to be taken, but that's why this is before us today, but I wanted to give a little history as to how it, how it started as well. So, um, but thank you. Okay, any action on? Can I make, can I make it? Oh, please, Laura. Hi. Um, I just want to say that I think that there's a few events that happen in San Bruno that are neighborhood events that I think are really positive and I'd like to see them continue. I think it's a really positive event and I know that kids from outside that neighborhood come, <laughs> to, the, come to that area to block off. Um, Glenview um, in, the Mills, in, the, in the Parkview area is another area that gets blocked off for the Santa Claus and those are I think really uplifting. We don't have a lot of community events throughout the year so I think um, it's a safety thing and I, and I like to just see that the residents know about it, know the address if um, maybe we can publicly tonight just state what the address is that's being cordoned off so that residents who are listening tonight and they've got little kids and they want to bring them to um, that particular area that they feel safe and they can walk to the neighbors and that uh, it's, a, it's a great event and a lot of door, doors that do open. So you get a lot of doors um, for your walking. And quality candy. <laughs> I'm just saying, but you may want to let the neighborhood more know more are coming. Um, Move to approve. Is there a second? second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I have 5 0 voice approval. Okay, now we'll move on to conduct of business. Item 6A appoint citizen to fill one vacancy on the San Bruno Planning Commission. On October 15, 2019, the City Council held a special meeting to interview um, applicants for the one vacancy on the Planning Commission. The applicants that were interviewed were Marco Durazzo, Tom Gardner, Aros Ensberg Harmon, James Mahon, and Matthew Sum. Thank you. So, what we'll do at this time, unless Council has any um, differences, that we'll go ahead and open it for a nomination, a second, and then I'll put that off to the side, and then we'll we'll continue, and then we'll see, um, and then we'll we'll bring them back. Is that, is that acceptable to everybody? To the chair, if I could just make. Uh, a brief comment before Please. we open it up. I, I just wanted to say that um, this um, this appointment is a little bit different from the ones that we make for some of the other committees, and it is definitely a very important one. Um, we we had very um, I think really great interviews with the candidates with with all of them, and it really was an impressive group that. Um, that volunteered to, to be interviewed for the position. And I just wanted to thank everyone that, uh, that came out and spent the time with us and gave us their thoughts and uh, you know, shared their, their vision for you know, the city and, and let us know what, um, what their interest was. So I just wanted to say that because um, 
you know, we, we can only appoint one, unfortunately, but we had excellent candidates, and so I just uh, wanted everyone to feel that, uh, or t to know that uh, we did appreciate it, and we were, we were. I think, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, that you all agree that it was a, a very impressive group. I think you'd have a 5-0 vote on that. <laughs> uh, and again, we do hold it on a separate evening uh, because obviously we want to give a more specialized time. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's usually sometimes folks are in a group setting, but we bring each person in uh, individually to be interviewed and go through the uh, questions and process. And they not only have the application, but they have a additional uh, questionnaire that is also provided. Keep in mind, as uh, Michael said, now they have to fill out Form 700 when appointed. Now they have to worry about the Brown Act, and, and their pay is zero. And uh, that means the architectural review meetings. That means two meetings a month. Um, and that means that you know, you're know you more of a public figure, per se, that people are going to ask questions about what you did, uh, where your interests lie, and et cetera. So um, it, it is appreciated that these folks are willing to uh, give up their time and their love for their community. So with that, why don't we move on to uh, nominations. Mr. Mayor. Marty. I'd like to no nominate Marco DeRazzo. Is there a second? Other nominations? I'd like to nominate um, Mr. Harmon. I'll second. Are there any other? I have a motion and a second from Irene and Michael on Mr. Harmon. Are there any other nominations? I'd like to nominate Mr. Uh, Sum. Is there a second? Any other nominations? At this point, the one nomination so far, unless I hear anything else, is Mr. Harmon. That has had a motion and second. Are there any other nominations? If not, is there any action by council? Move to approve. Who? Move to appoint. Or appoint, sorry. M Mr. Mr. Harmon. Harmon. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and second to approve Mr. Harmon on the Planning Commission. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? 5-0 vote. Mr. Harmon, congratulations. Uh, you now will go to the library and you'll begin reading. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. To, to, the chair, to the chair, can I just make a comment? Yes. Um, I just want to say thank you for your time. Um, and Michael, I did owe your comments as well. Um, I will say that I felt definitely that one candidate stood out amongst the rest. I felt like you came prepared, you were very knowledgeable. Um, I know it's not an easy setting, sitting across uh, a rambunctious group like us, but um, I felt that you were the right candidate for that, and I definitely um, concur with uh, my candidate, my other council members here who have supported you. And uh, I think it's a really important job. Um, it, you know, you, the planning commission and what you have to offer and your vote coming to council weighs heavy on a lot of our decisions. And so I appreciate your time and dedication um, to this upcoming uh, planning commission. So thank you. Any other comments? No pressure. <laughs> um, I know you won't let us down. Yes. Okay, with that again, as uh, Michael said, and I really do sincerely appreciate everybody that applied. I think we did ask questions too of some folks. Would they be interested in some other positions potentially? So uh, obviously your application will remain on file with the city clerk, and if a vacancy or other vacancies uh, open up, you will be reached out to. Next. Item 6B, adopt resolution, adopting the San Mateo Avenue conceptual streetscape plan. Through the uh, chair. Oh, sorry. Irene, no, please. Oh, I just, I need to recuse myself since I own property in the area. Okay. Marty. I believe I am also within that thousand foot, so. Uh. So both uh, Irene and Marty have recused themselves for living within the radius of thousand feet or less. And so they'll depart and then return after we've concluded this. City staff. Sure. Uh, Javon Grogan, city manager. Good afternoon, uh, council, members of the public. Um, we're here tonight for adoption of the San Mateo Ave uh, conceptual streetscape plan. Uh, as the city council and, and the community will remember, the draft plan was completed in September 
of this year and on September 24th, the City Council held a study session to receive public testimony, accept the report, and provide staff with feedback. Uh, staff have t has taken that feedback uh, and are here tonight uh, for Council hopeful acceptance of the plan. And I will now turn it over to Darcy Smith, the City's Community and Economic Development Director, that will give tonight's presentation. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. My name uh, is Darcy Smith, and I'm the City's Community and Economic Development Director, and I'll be making a brief presentation on the report for the adoption of the San Mateo Avenue Conceptual Streetscape Plan. The uh, agenda for the presentation tonight will quickly summarize the objective of tonight's meeting. I'll give you a brief background for the plan preparation, summarize the community and city engagement sessions, recap the City Council September study session, and summarize by closing before, with the action before you tonight. The consultant, Jacob Tobias of WRT, is in the audience tonight, and he will not be making a presentation as he made a long presentation in September that was very thorough. But he is available tonight to answer any questions if you have at the end of my presentation. And while I'm making the presentation, this was very much a multi-departmental effort with team members from the city's public works department and community services department, very engaged as this involved the city's streets and the city's parks and public art, as you heard earlier tonight. And the project planner, Rusha Dande, is also here tonight. And the city's planning and housing manager, Pamela Wu, who were very extensive in leading the efforts for our department. The objective for tonight's meeting is to end with hopefully you adopting the resolution to adopt this conceptual plan. And I'll just start with a one slide recap of the City Council study session on September 24th, where you reviewed this plan. We spent about an hour reviewing it, accepting public comments and answering extensive questions. And at that meeting, you were in support of the plan, which again was a conceptual design. Um, and you commented that you were very much in support of the simple and elegant design theme. There were two revisions made to the plan as a result of your comments. One was to add text studying a future potential vehicle drop-off and loading zone near Posey Park, which would also serve the Caltrain station on the western side. Access is primarily from the eastern side, um, and I think you were interested in having that loading zone added. Also, text was added to ensure that any future lighting elements, such as the hanging elements that are over the poseos in the conceptual design are studied to ensure they will withstand the heavy wind loads that can occur in downtown San Bruno. And I want to just close by saying that, I mean, it was overall, there was a lot of support voice by both from the community and the council. And I think that's a real testament to the extensiveness of the community and the city engagement and the consultant really deeply kind of understanding the setting in the downtown and what its strengths were, where the areas of, for improvement were. And ultimately, this is the community's design vision for the downtown. And I think what we heard throughout the whole process was sort of a consistent vision, which is great. There is that uni unity around what the downtown should be, um, what our assets are, and again, where the areas for improvement are. So that's a testament to the success, I think, of the process. So I'll cover the plan background. We probably have some new audience members tonight. Um, and aren't familiar with that, but much of this is repetitive. As you may know, the city adopted the general plan back in 2009, and that general plan focused a lot on rebuilding the downtown. The city had a redevelopment agency, it invested in the downtown, had the vision to move the Caltrain station to the downtown, um, which was a significant public works project. It is the heart of our downtown, heart of our city, and I think we've, um, We've invested in other areas of the city, but the downtown it is in need of significant investment. Um, the transit quarters plan, which covered the city's downtown and the redevelopment area before it was um, eliminated, identified this sh streetscape plan as a short-term implementation item. So here we are six years later getting started on it. But I think the vision of that transit quarter plan was to stimulate economic investment in the city. So this is very much an economic revitalization plan in line with the goals of the general plan and the transit quarters plan. As a matter of background, the general plan lays out that vision. And, and this, this action tonight, 10 years later, really solidifies that vision. You have the symbolic heart of the city, the downtown. You have the main street. And the goal with this plan is to improve the aesthetics 
also expand the streetscape amenities, which are things like benches and lighting, things that make the, the downtown sidewalks a really nice place to walk, improving crosswalks so it's safer to cross the street, and just overall upgrade the appearance. And I want to emphasize this is a combined effort. This isn't just the city. This involves merchants and property owners, and I'll give you some examples of how we engage them in the community engagement efforts. But it really did bring out a, a, a wide audience in the downtown, some business owners who hadn't really involved with the city. Um, up until this point. And really the goal is to make a destination downtown where people like to go to dine or they shop, um, they go to the park, park areas, and they have a place to meet. So the streetscape plan essentially lays out that vision, as I mentioned, to create a place, a sense of identity. It's basically what you want the street to be. And all of the major downtowns around us have had streetscape plans. Um, this community has had streetscape plans too in the past. They it, it just weren't, the funding wasn't necessarily there to implement that, them at that time. Um, you can see downtowns here like Laurel Street and San Carlos and other communities that have done some great things around their downtowns like the lighting you see here. And I want to emphasize a lot of these communities started with the plan and then over many times were able to secure the funding. There's a lot of grant funding once you have this plan in place. There's lots of other ways to um, make an investment over time. And why is the plan needed? It really does spur economic revitalization, but it also helps the city when we work with private property owners to tell them these are our expectations for the street design. Instead of trying to guess at what kind of sidewalk width we should have or what benches we should have on a new project, we have the vision laid out in this plan and we will require all private property owners to make investments consistent with this plan on private property and in the cities right away when they build in front of um, their properties. I want to emphasize we will really strive through the budget process to initiate some maybe lower budget quick wins such as new trash cans, some signage. There's a lot of things in this plan that can be added over time and if we do go in and put in new sidewalks we can you know store the trash cans, we can hold on to the signage. There are some expensive items that's generally sort of the paving and the park improvements. There, there are other sources for park improvements such as the development impact fee which you initiated. Um, and people are paying into that. So I want to emphasize that the funding, this really lays the foundation for future funding and some of that funding may be incremental, some of it may be through grants, um, but we're really committed to implement this plan. So the key characteristics of the plan are, again, define the streetscape, have that co cohesive identity, focus on things that are really important to the community, lighting, benches, signage, um, safer sidewalks, so having sidewalks that are functional for people of all ages and pleasant. The project workflow, so this has been about a year ago when the city first released the request for proposals. You authorized funding for this plan in January and the plan process took about eight months and see the process here, we start with sort of feasibility analysis, the community engagement, which I'll talk about and span several months of intensive engagement and finally the plan preparation. So quickly I'll go over the community engagement, which was kind of this plan, unlike maybe the general plan or the transit quarter plans or the downtown parking management plan, gave us a real opportunity to do something neat, which was have a walking workshop. We held that on a weekday with the business community, got really great turnout, and it was sort of a conversation about what are some of the great things about the downtown, but what are some challenges? Of course, we stood in front of a trash can and thought, aha, yeah, that's a challenge, but we looked at the trees, we looked at the crossings, we looked at um, all the things that we thought just needed some, some attention. We held a drop-in workshop, which was on a Saturday afternoon in front of Citibank Plaza. That allowed us to really get a great audience of children. You'll see them here um, drawing on the sidewalk. That little heart says the avenue. Um, and we did sort of rank choicing with the dots, which is always fun. But I think what you'll see in this photo is just the wide variety of people who engaged in this effort. And that's partially because we went to them. We went out and had the walking workshop. We, we had this workshop that was just drop in, very casual with some fun balloons. Um, and I just want to commend the consultant and the city staff kind of went above and beyond the norm to host these fun workshops. Um, I think we just got a different audience. When we actually had the nighttime workshop, which was in this room on a weekday at seven, we, we only got about a dozen people. <laughs> and I think it's a testament to the evolution of community engagement. We also had an online survey with about 100 respondents. That was very great. Um, and we also had stakeholder meetings. So again, we went out to the community. We met with um, very engaged community members like Dennis Samet, but we also got less engaged people who said, this is sort of our first experience with the city asking us, like, how can we make the downtown better? Um, 
And I will tell you that the chamber has been very involved with more of a presence in the downtown hosted in the entrepreneurial center. So you know, again, we're kind of coming to their, their main street and engaging with them. And I will say that's been very positive. Um, we also engage city staff. We engage the police department. I mentioned public works, community services, but we also had meetings with a wide variety of city committees and commissions. In addition to the planning commission who reviewed it twice, we, we went to culture and arts committee, had a great you know, conversation with them. It wasn't a, a lecture session. It was very much a conversation about what are the opportunities for art. We met with parks and rec commission because again, the streetscaping plan includes two uh, parks. They may seem like forgotten plazas, but they are identified as city's parks, and that also gives us a funding source. And the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. The Pedestrian Advisory Committee is very engaged around these issues, such as pedestrian design, pedestrian safety, um, and they were offered great feedback. So in closing, I'll just summarize. We, we had the September study session, and you had some great suggestions. One, you can see here with Posey Park to look at a drop-off zone. It is a little tight. Um, but that said, I think when we look at the design for this plaza and reinvigorating it, um, looking at drop-off could, could be really important here. And the, you see this great example of the art, and someone said, well, that looks, I mean, the hanging lights, that looks great, but gosh, don't want it to fall on anyone. So if, and if we do proceed with this great light, which I thought was kind of an interesting way to light the Paseo, you can see really kind of draws people in, then we'd study um, the wind load feasibility. But it, it has been done. The picture on the right is a real picture, so I think it is feasible. So we didn't want to eliminate these completely. So last I'll close with just what's the outcome of this plan? It is really, again, it was set by the community and the council and the commissions that we visited. It's to design the downtown to have a simple and elegant design with activated paseos, better public spaces, unified street features, and again, that unique identity. And what's the identity? It's the city's heart. It's the city's main street, the downtown. Um, in closing, I just wanted to thank the consultant team too. We had a great consultant. Um, Jacob Tobias from WRT was the lead. We also had CSW help with engineering and Parisi transportation consultants who also did, I think, the transit cores plan and has worked with us in the past. So in closing, tonight's action is a request to adopt a resolution adopting this conceptual streetscape plan. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have or direct them to the consultant, Jacob Tobias. Laura. To the chair. Darcy, I just want to say thank you so much because I think you've just been a tremendous asset to the staff at the city. Um, it's so, just so exciting to see where we've come and to feel like we know that this can happen. Um, you've put together a great team. The work that you've done this past year is just exceptional. So thank you. I just want to make sure I say that. Um, <clears throat> the other comment I want to make is that I, I was one of the ones that made the comment last time about Posey Park and maybe doing a um, drop-off. There really is a drop-off. It's just further down. And I think maybe it's just not... Um, maybe it needs some striping or some better signage. And so there is, there is really a drop off. I just think it's not clear. So when you walk, you see things differently than when you actually drive. So when I walked, I saw what I needed to see. Um, I love the street sign that goes up and over the same two Avenue. I think that's just beautiful. And I'd love to, I'd love to see that one versus the half court. Um, so just overall, uh, the vision that you've created for the streetscape fan is exactly, I think, what, this, what the residents want. Um, you know, we, it's something that's it's pleasant, it's a safety, there's, there's red zones, there's um, a, a lighting, um, big trees, uh, the design, the, the, I mean, everything I think that everybody's been talking about. And so I, I believe in the vision and I know that, that this, this uh, San Mateo Avenue will just be a very beautiful place. Um, I think, I think one of the comments as a resident, and maybe we can stop at this question is, we've done this before with no results. How can we assure residents that once a plan is, is approved and adopted by the city council that we will actually move forward? And so maybe tell me a little bit, I mean, and there's, there's some big numbers and there's phase one, phase two, but what does it take for, and maybe in your experience, what does it take for a plan like this to come to fruition where residents can really feel excited about it and know something like this can happen? City manager. Uh, yeah, L let me take the, uh, the first part of that and then Darcy can chime in. Um, 
You're right. Uh, at, at $19 million, do we have $19 million to execute this plan right now? No, we do not. Uh, all the downtowns that we all love and enjoy uh, that we see are revitalized really started with a plan. And, and that's what this is. This is taking the first step and creating that palette uh, and saying, here's what we envision. The other thing that we should remember is that uh, we do not have to do it all with the city's dollars. Uh, part of creating the palette is when there is private market investment along the downtown, we are saying to the developer how they should improve uh, the, the front uh, of their property in the pedestrian realm. And so not all of it is funded with city dollars. Uh, the other point, and Darcy hit on this a little bit, uh, is that we do have two parks there, um, Polsey Park and Centennial Park, and we do have park and loo funds and development impact fee funds uh, that will pay uh, for some of those park improvements that can be dedicated towards downtown. The other sort of overarching on the balcony statement that I, uh, I think is important to make is, um, as we have uh, development proposals and as we negotiate for community benefits, I think this needs to be high on the list because we know it's high on the list of what the community has articulated for what they want in their downtown. And so as we have development projects that are coming into the city uh, and if there's a community benefit proposal, I think this is uh, high on the list uh, of what staff is negotiating for. Outside of that, it's looking for every piece of revenue we have to, to dedicate to it. Um, you know, we have a half cent sales tax measure that could be general purpose. Uh, you know, a large portion of the community has identified roads, roads, roads as, as the number one thing. That's not to say that there might be some small project that needs a little quick win uh, or seed funding to make a, an immediate improvement. And so we will continue to uh, sort of strive for every avenue, but uh, it all starts with the plan. And we don't have the money to fund the plan now, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't articulate the vision. Well said, thank you so much for that. Um, so I wanna focus on the two parks. So let's we'll start with Posey Park. Uh, I agree, I mean, we need to move benching toward the street and keep it away from the back. If you talk to anybody who works for Caltrans, um, it's a constant problem with homelessness and uh, they're, they're down there fixing the elevators. You wouldn't believe people are getting locked in elevators because of uh, the, the vandalism that's happening. So I, I wanna make sure that whatever we come up with and to put money towards that it's sort of vandal proof. I don't know if that's even possible. Um, but yeah, anything it needs to be some sort of space that's uh, you know, permeable, number one, right? Get rid of all, a lot of cement and add more um, greenery and bigger trees. And so I think staff's kind of hit it. I think, it's, I think they know what, what the problems are. Um, the fountain, and, and I hate to hear the word defunct, but you know, 10 years ago, when we, we, we thought about development, we thought about fountains, fountains were a great idea. Well, guess what? We hit a drought and fountains aren't a great idea. So I understand where we're coming and that there's a need to do something different than that, than having a fountain that's gonna waste water, that's a precious resource that we don't need to have. Um, and that comes with problems and issues too. So let's make something that's beautiful and there's so much great things you could do with greenery and whatnot. So I think that's a great idea. Um, the other park that's across from Bank of America, um, I, I guess I don't know what the long-term vision is because I know we need parking, so I just am afraid or fearful of, you know, could that be the entrance to a downtown parking thing? It's a, it's a lot we own. We don't have to go buy the lot. So I want to see something happen, but I don't want to put a ton of money into something that I know, you know, 10 years down the road, five years down the road, we've got a plan to do something that we're going to tear it up. So I think we need to be careful on what we decide to do there. Um, that would be another question. Uh, parking. So uh, as a parents, as a former owner of a business on San Mateo Avenue, parking is your number one. To lose two spots in front of my business is kind of devastating, right? It's two less spots that I have. I know in the 400 block, it's pretty limited on parking. We've added a new uh, aperture that doesn't have as much parking. The commercial space isn't even open yet, and parking is a constant struggle. So my question is, is there anywhere to squeeze more parking anywhere in the downtown area? From a red, cu red curb that's not needed, we can gain a spot here. Is there anything on the El Camino that we can gain? Is there anything, because we're gonna lose, what is it, 11 spots on San Mateo Avenue? So it's something like that. So I just, I know we need this, the spots because I think the safety is a big piece. We should be able to drop off somebody on, on San Mateo Avenue that's a handicapped spot. Um, so I just, I don't know what can be done. I don't know, you know, even if it's, if it's if even possible, but I don't know if anything's been looked at, um, but I hate to lose parking and I know we need to, but I hate to lose parking. So I'm always afraid of that. Um, I think that those are all my comments. Let me just see. 
Uh, I can't wait to see larger trees. I mean, when you look down San Mateo Avenue, I want to see the greenery, not a lot of old storefronts, although storefronts are pretty unique and different, and I love that, that look too, so we're not going to take away from that. One of the big problems that happened on the last uh, streetscape remodel was those, and I think you, I saw it in one of your pictures in the present in your packet was the big planter boxes, big planter boxes and overgrown shrubbery that now you can't see beyond beyond those. They took up a lot of parking and then you took up a lot of visibility. So I don't want to see something that's at that eye level that's now blocking the view of something that's on a business that's trying to stay open and keep their doors open front. Um, and I appreciate the work the staff has done on this project and uh, the business and the community input. It's been really good to hear a lot of people and see the attendance at these meetings. At these. Thank you. Michael, I can go to you or uh, there are two speakers. Which, which, which I'll just make some quick, my, my comments are, are, are very brief. And uh, I, I think Laura addressed a lot, of, uh, a lot of what I had to say and I really do think it is a good plan. And uh, I also thank staff for all the work they put into it. Um, I know there were questions about, you know, the value of this plan where there, when there is no money to, to do any of it. But um, yeah, I agree with, with staff that uh, the timing, timing is everything. And I, I do think that having this plan in place right now, when we are starting to see some interest in, in developing uh, parcels in San Bruno is important because we don't want to move ahead with those unless we have a, a bigger plan. And I think this was a key component, something that was missing from the other planning that we had done. So I definitely welcome this. I, I, I think it's uh, definitely going to make downtown look great. And if we can implement it uh, incrementally, um, it'll, it'll definitely go from there. But we, we need a catalyst and, and having this in place, I think, is, is very important. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I'd like to move to our two speakers and then I'll have some comments, please. Val Morgan. <coughs> I know it's, it's good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I know it's a long meeting and I'll be very brief. <laughs> um, I've attended all of the meetings to do with the downtown because it's something just close to my heart. First of all, I'd like to thank Jacob, uh, Rivka, and Josh, I believe it was, from the WRT for all their hard work and for the city uh, staff for all their work to, in bringing this to fruition. I love the plan in general. I just have a few comments. I'm wondering, is it possible to persuade Caltrans to continue their bus route along San Mateo Avenue to the El Camino rather than turning it up Genevieve? and provide two more bus stop shelters closer to the El Camino. Um, I sincerely hope that the Posey Park and Centennial Parks will be included in this project, as many people present at the meetings and street walk express this too. I hope uh, that the drop-off passenger loading zone for Caltrans Station will be included at the Posey Park. It just makes a lot of sense to have it there. I have to say I'm disappointed in the three proposed designs for the Centennial Park. This area will be the focal point for the whole downtown. We need a plaza with as much open space, paved space as possible. There could be planters on both sides with lots of seating for people to sit and read and enjoy their lunch, and space for children to run and play and maybe ride their tricycles around. There should be a nice fence or wall t at the back to screen off the parking lot. There should be a flagpole uh, uh, that can be raised for various ceremonies and also a raised platform for entertainers or somebody to make a speech uh, uh, should have cover over it. And a large open area uh, would be, could accommodate a small farmer's market or a gathering place for art exhibitions or musical events. And we should keep a fountain there as well because it's a big attraction for children. Finally, I think that the streets should be referred to as the downtown San, as downtown San Bruno. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Aros Harmon. <clears throat> Good evening, Aros Harmon, uh, 633 Second Ave in Bel Air. Uh, I first want to really quickly ask, am I allowed to comment now? Because I, if I've been appointed to the Planning Commission and I'm within, I'm sure I'm within whatever is the relevant range. Well, you know what? We admire that you're already concerned about that. Thank you. <laughs> so, 
Uh, okay. You haven't been sworn. All right. Yes. Um, and yes, so my, my lovely spouse, Plymouth, could not be here tonight. She is visiting family. She would be uh, very upset with me if I did not provide her continuous, more public art. Um, in particular, I mean, we, uh, I mean, we walk into downtown from the Angus Avenue entrance, and we always look at that just bare wall and go, that would make a great mural. Um, and the, the, the walls underneath the Caltrain underpass as well. Um, I mean, I think this is an opportunity to, I mean, every high school in America has some great artists in it, you know? I mean, this is an opportunity that you could, you could really look at, at having like a sort of a school project to develop ideas for it and implement it. Um, for myself, I, I just wanna endorse uh, the previous speaker. I really would like to see uh, that Centennial Park broadened out with the parking that is behind it concentrated into taller structures. So if you, if you take all of those flat lots we have and essentially stack them up in a smaller space that both you know, move that out towards the ends, uh, obviously you're gonna need some parking in the middle for handicapped spots as was discussed and drop off, but if you move more of the parking out, we could open up that space and have a space for farmers markets, festivals, um, maybe some kind of um, a fountain along the lines if you're familiar with the very flat one that has the, the tubes that's on the oval in San Jose. Uh, that kids love and something you could turn on for limited amounts of time, use less water, not have it on continuously. Um, <clears throat> and then in general, I would like to see uh, sort of more space along the sidewalks, which kind of leads me into my other comment. I know we discussed in my, my interview the other day my concerns about incentives for assembly of parcels as we're doing this. I think if we can find a way to give the current parcel owners incentives to essentially take their floor space and compress it a little bit away from the current sidewalk right away, create more outdoor seating while building up. You get more floor space while taking up a smaller footprint. Um, it creates more, more public space and you can have that kind of public private transition with cafes having street side seating and so on. Um, so, but yeah, I'm really happy to, to see this moving forwards and I'm thrilled to be Looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Any other uh, folks who wanted to speak on this item? Tom. Mr. Tom Hamilton. I didn't fill out a card, but I'll, but so I'll be fast. Um, I want to echo uh, uh, some of what um, uh, Commissioner Morgan said. Uh, I'm, I, I was definitely in favor of this when we came before the Planning Commission. Um, I would like to see, uh, as part of the Centennial um, Park redesign, uh, uh, open space, for, open space uh, places for, for seating, um, also uh, performance space. You know, a, a stage where you can have you know live music. You know, encourage uh, events and encourage people to come to to downtown. Um, I also want to uh, echo a couple of comments that I said uh, when this was presented at planning, which are um, in response to some um, comments that we got, uh, public comments that we got um, before it came to planning. Um, one was, why do this if you don't have the money for it? And the other was, um, we've tried this before and it failed. So the reason you do this um, is, how, how, how will we know how much money to go out and find unless we know what we want and how much it costs? So that's why, that's why we do this. And that's why this is the first step. And second, that we've tried this before and it didn't work, that's true, but if, you take that as your as your guide, then there'll never be any progress on anything anywhere. So that's just ridiculous. And I, I know you guys won't, won't uh, accept that feedback. So that's great. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Anybody else who wanted to speak on this topic? Okay. Um, for myself, I mean, some of the comments were already uh, discussed, so I'm not gonna be, reiterate everything. But on Centennial Park, you know, as history is, the city bought Wells Fargo a long time ago, and that was to have skin in the game, to say we own something on San Mateo Avenue, this is back when I was on city staff, and uh, therefore they had it, and then it was just a chain link fence, and then therefore you have it today, which was in-house staff that came together, put something together, utilized what currently uh, staff had on hand to have something temporarily. Well, obviously that temporary has become quite lengthy. Um, my understanding too, but I need clarification from staff, is the Centennial Park was purchased 
through redevelopment. And therefore, it being redevelopment, there might be some provision that it has to remain open space of some sort, because if it's sold or utilized for a different means, then it has to go back and, and the monies, and I just want to clarify. That, that, well. is, that is correct. It's um, designated as a park, and there's a deed restriction on that property. Okay. So it kind of is a park, and we'll almost have to remain a park. If we were to sell it or do that, then it goes back to various agencies, not just the city. Um, do the chair on, yes. on that question, if we could get some clarification. So it has to remain a park or just open space or public space? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure of that answer, but I know that if it's something other than a park and possibly open space, I'd have to look at the deed okay. uh, to see what it says. Then a, a share of the proceeds would have to go back to all the taxing agencies as a result of, of that. Okay, thank you. So um, that kind of restricts potentially what can be utilized. But I would agree that uh, what we hear from a lot is it's nice, it's there, but it's roped off. And if you want to call it a park, Parks don't have ropes that keep people out. So, um, I mean, that is something, if it is going to be what it is, then, then let's have it more user-friendly and have it as something that can be occupied and or even expanded in, in some elements. Um, when we talk about streetlights, uh, there's been, since the last time they had the AV um, unveiling, uh, we ha have, have had new streetlights. And I know back then that Ken I Bear and I were very adamant about trying one on Genevan because of the wind and the element and the abuse that the old ones received that didn't, they weren't durable enough. They didn't hold up. They didn't light up well enough. So we took one and we, we had it as a test pilot and then to see. And obviously there were things that we learned from that. So I want to preface with staff, I think that that's critical to do. Not just say, well, guess what? We're just going to replace them all. I think we really have to be cognizant of what durability, uh, whether it's weather, whether it's wind, um, some element, some areas are worse than others, and then that light visibility. Because every time we go to a better light, then we have about two years later, people say, God, the, the lighting is not good. So I think that's something that needs to be um, thought of. On the Posey Park, you know, we do have one fountain that is not and has not been functioning. Uh, when that concept came in, it was to have two fountains, one on each side. And it was gone back to just one fountain, which was probably a good decision back then. So, you know, I think that's one of those things that, A, it looks undone, just like the arch, undone. Um, that, those are the impressions you receive. You drive through uh, underneath the uh, uh, overpass, and there's these things sticking here. And nobody, you know, we could probably do a contest in town. What were, what were these supposed to be for? Because I don't know that everybody knows, and, and they're still wondering. Uh, the fountain, I know we've talked about either having it repaired or having it then with landscaping or, or vegetation. But however, as we change things too, I want us to be mindful of upkeep of the pots. So if the pots, now we have the weeds, so now we have staff individually going to each of those, trying to water them or trying to do this or that. So I want us to be mindful of beauty also has a cost. And so I think we need to be cognizant of that. And obviously the way Posey Park is laid out today, in hindsight, Obviously, there's some things that need to be modified to that that has it more open and probably has it more visible uh, for people to see as they're driving by or law enforcement. Um, the, I think something, um, you know, the street sign that Laura talked about going across, I really like that. I think the street sign that we have currently that has been there for a long time, the top part's already been taken off. Uh, and the entrance down San Mateo Avenue from El Camino is not ideal um, in my mind. And I think a sign like that is, is very becoming um, and hopefully certainly not as much as the arch was going to cost. But I also think that when we look to, to vegetation, that's always been a problem with the trees because of the way it is underneath. So then we go into avenues that take up more parking. We try to get seats that maybe skateboarders can use or that maybe people can just lie down on. And I think we need to be cognizant of all those things going forward and the anti-graffiti type elements. And we do need to make some improvements. <clears throat> so if that means trash cans, um, and I know there was a group that I had spoken to in our community that wanted to help fund some of those. So I'd like to have us utilize those type of opportunities. And if that means they have a little, little insignia on that garbage can, 
I'm good with that, and I and I think the community would be okay, to, depending on what the insignia is. But uh, but if people in the community want to reach out for that, our social groups, I, I think service groups, I think that's great. I think the other thing too is, I know we need a plan, and you have to have something written, and you have to have some kind of cost and elements, and figure out when we get community benefits and dollars are raised, what can we do wh with what? And I think staff needs to have a, a prioritized of what's reasonable, what's good, what doesn't get us. If we go down a path of garbage cans or seats, and then we come back a year and we go, you know what, that wasn't the great call, because maybe it's not in the bigger overall picture. So I want us to be cognizant to that, but I think also, um, I think the community, the garbage cans are, are obviously need to be repaired or, or replaced. And I think there are small things we can do um, when the monies are available, but I think we do need a plan. I think there needs to come back from staff a prioritization of what the priorities are for San Mateo Avenue. I think it needs to come back with a timeline of what those would be if those were implemented. Prioritization and timelines for implementation. Um, and I think the trees being larger, I, I wouldn't disagree with that either, uh, but not vegetation that blocks the, the business. Um, and the public art idea, Mr. Harmon, that you brought up, reminds me back, I'm going way back when I was young, Cappuccino High, but um, <clears throat> we had uh, some folks who did do murals. They were allowed back then. Um, and they were beautiful, and they lasted, and they weren't vandalized. So you know, there are possibilities. And so I think if we get it more colorful, more inviting, more well lit, and we have the merchants have the expectation of what their needs and, and expectations are going into uh, an operation of a business, I think that would be helpful. So those are some of my remarks. Sorry for my voice. Through the, through the chair, can I just get clarification? Um, the priority ranking that was included in the report, is that not acceptable? I know a timeline I would say is difficult because it's really about funding. Is that you ask me? No, I, I, I would agree if they say if, if, if my money can be done for benches and seating and that's it, and they come back and say we have a community benefit, we have $2 million, and we think this is the top priority out of all that that we can do for now, then that's what I mean by the priorities. Because we're not going to be able, in my mind, to do all of one right away. So within priority one, he wants to see a little bit of clarification. So understood. Maybe we'll look at each tear at a time as we get through the process. And things may change too. They may come back and say, "Guess what? We really can uh, collectively with some um, new development or downtown that that they they can and want to go forward with this item." Uh, can I ask through the chair? Can I ask another question? Um, since we're talking about Posey Park and that's all kind of connected <coughs> to Caltran, can I continue down San Mateo Avenue going north? and get to San Bruno Avenue and San Mateo Avenue, and there's like these two sort of incomplete posts on either side of San Bruno Avenue with bolts sticking out That's the arch. Um, that needed to have an archway go across it. Is that possible that this is part of tier one? Good question. Um, hard answer, sort of all contingent uh, upon funding, uh, but uh, Ad addressing those arches and the exposed bolts was not a part of, of this plan. It really looked at the heart of San Mateo um, Avenue. Uh, I, I do think that um, being here just a, a little over a year, having heard that uh, probably more times than I can count, um, you know, figuring out a plan for that. Um, the old plan was scrapped due to cost um, over a million dollars uh, for for the archway. Uh, but the boats are exposed and there could be some public art that, that goes on either side um, that it, is at a moderate cost or you sort of scrap it, uh, cut the boats off and, and uh, design something that doesn't look unfinished or undone. Um, and so I, I take that comment to heart and um, we will uh, talk about staff's work plan and figure out where we can fit, fit that in. Thank you. And also even we've talked about a monument sign that we used to have before the grade sub, which had the Lions or the Rotary or the 4-H, uh, Troop 72, and it had the various organizations that are in the community. So whether that can be modified an arch to that, I don't know. I'm not the expert in that area, but I think that is something else that the community has desired so that people that are driving into our city know, you know, maybe Rotary meets the, you know, the first and the third or, or Lions, et cetera. So I think that was another thing. I'm sorry, Val, did you? 
Yeah, it's just a quick comment. Um, it may be possible to get YouTube or some of the larger companies to sponsor some of the work downtown. Just well, I'm sure the city manager and uh, community development director, uh, Smith, are already thinking that. Uh, any other comments? Questions? Laura? Okay, this, this, this is an action item. Uh, resolution. Motion to approve the resolution of the proposed streetscape plan. Second. <coughs> Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Salazar? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Motion carries three to zero to two with Vice Mayor O'Connell and Council Member Medina recused. Thank you. And if we can call them back in. Item 6C, adopt resolution authorizing the Crestmore Canyon Wildfire Mitigation Project in the fiscal year 2019-20 capital improvement budget and appropriating $125,000 from the Emergency Disaster Reserve Fund to initiate project planning and environmental clearance processes. City Manager. Sure. Um, Javon Grogan, City Manager. Uh, to, to the City Council, uh, members of the public, I'm standing up here today to give the City Council a presentation about the proposed Crestmore Canyon Wildfire Mitigation Project. Uh, sort of up on the title slide is my name and uh, City Attorney Mark Zaffirano. I'll be given to, uh, today's presentation, but Mark is here. And so together we've sort of led the development of this project. And so first off, let's talk about our objectives today. Uh, we want the City Council to receive information on the proposed Crestmore Canyon Wildfire Mitigation Project. Uh, through tonight's uh, actions, we are asking the City Council to adopt a resolution uh, formally authorizing the project uh, in the fiscal year 1920 budget uh, for our capital improvement program. Uh, we are also asking the City Council to uh, provide an additional allocation of $125,000 from the City's Emergency Disaster Reserve Fund to initiate the project planning and environmental clearance processes, uh, some of which have begun. <coughs> we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and so our agenda for to tonight's presentation, uh, it looks long, but it'll be brief. Uh, we'll give a quick background overview, or I'll give a quick background overview of the canyon. Uh, we'll talk about some recent actions that have uh, been taken to mitigate and address the issue. Uh, we'll talk about uh, pg and &E and community service hours and uh, the 2010 Crestmore explosion and how that relates to this project. Uh, we'll also talk to a, a request that uh, the city attorney, uh, with my assistance, made to Judge William Alsup. Uh, we'll t uh, then we'll uh, talk about uh, action by council, and we're open for any questions. So a little bit about Crestmore Canyon. The community uh, knows of, um, a lot, but just by way of background, it is the city's largest open space area. Um, there are approximately 321 homes in the Crestmore and Rollingwood uh, neighborhood that will be immediately affected by a fire in the canyon. Uh, but more specifically, there are 137 homes that surround the canyon, a school as well as um, both city and school district uh, facilities. Uh, the canyon itself is 76.6 acres. Uh, it is a very heavily wooded area uh, that has um, trails that are, are used by uh, some people in the community for exploration and hiking. Um, it contains some native trees, mainly uh, Monterey pine, California live oak, uh, but a lot of non-native uh, eucalyptus trees, as is um, uh, similar uh, in a large parts of the region. Uh, really close proximity to a lot of uh, regional uh, and arterial road, Sneef Lane to the north, um, Skyline Boulevard to the west, San Bruno Ave to the south, uh, and 280 to the east. Um, and within a quarter mile, uh, actually less than a quarter mile, of the canyon 
uh, is uh, 1,200 acres of open space, uh, Sweeney Ridge, which is identified uh, as a state response area for high, uh, uh, for high fire danger. And so um, that area faces significant danger. Uh, a fire in that area uh, uh, is the responsibility of, of CAL FIRE. Uh, but here, uh, Crestmore Canyon uh, is our responsibility. Uh, as members in the community will know, uh, during the 2010 uh, PG&E gas pipeline explosion and fire, uh, a small portion of the fire actually spread into the canyon. Uh, but thankfully, uh, uh, due to some quick thinking and heroic efforts of our first responders on the scene, uh, that fire was mitigated. And uh, part of the reasons why it was mitigated is that there was some really quick thinking to call in a CAL FIRE uh, helicopter to drop fire retardant on the base of the canyon and the surrounding area. Uh, and, and that really uh, largely prevented a um, more significant de devastation and, and loss of life um, uh, on that night. And so uh, we know that Crestmore Canyon is a significant fire risk to the city. Um, and actually, um, later on tonight's agenda, uh, we have an uh, update of the Crestmore Glenview Neighborhood Reconstruction Project. Uh, but as a part of that project, uh, the $50 million that the city received from PG&E to rebuild the neighborhood, there was a, initially a, a vision to do wildfire mitigation in the canyon and an initial estimate of $1.9 million. Um, unfortunately, the cost to rebuild the neighborhood um, uh, was significant, and, and that project could not be done. Uh, but, but even um, back then, there was significant concerns about um, fire danger and um, um, uh, the desire to, to have a significant project to clear out some of the underbrush and vegetation. So what are some of the recent actions that uh, the city council uh, has taken? And so I, I wanted to highlight a few uh, because uh, we have been doing what we can within our resources. So um, in FY 1819, uh, the city applied for and received a $15,000 grant from the California Fire Foundation. Uh, and that work was, um, that grant was received and that work was done and it uh, cleared a lot of the underbrush around the fire road and provided better access uh, should there be a fire to that fire road. Uh, we also applied for, but unfortunately did not receive a $200,000 CAL FIRE Climate Investments uh, Fire Prevention Grant uh, for hazard mitigation and vegetation clearing in the canyon. Uh, and at the beginning of this year, July of 2019, the City Council approved $37,000 for a city wild wire, wildfire hazard risk assessment to identify the level of fire risk and potential fire hazards throughout the city. Uh, and to develop um, an appropriate ongoing plan for uh, mitigation based on parcel density, uh, road network complexity, uh, distance to fire stations and environmental elements. And so that plan um, is nearly complete and actually uh, in the report that you have before you, there's an attachment too that really uh, shows the canyon uh, and really confirms that out of all of our fire risk areas in the city, uh, the canyon uh, is, um, uh, one of the most uh, significant um, areas, uh, if not the most significant area, uh, certainly the most significant area b by land mass uh, and homes surrounding it. In addition, in the current budget, the 1920 budget, uh, uh, even though we had uh, some fiscal challenges and uh, having a balanced budget, the city council uh, uh, directed staff to include 75,000 uh, for vegetation management and fire mitigation work in the canyon. Uh, and so that is currently uh, in the budget. So what else has staff been working on? Uh, we've been working to establish uh, the project that is before you, which uh, we've titled the Crestmore Canyon Wildfire Mitigation Project. Uh, and we've been developing maps, and we'll show you one uh, really quickly, that calls for uh, up to a 100-foot um, uh, defensible uh, um, space and vegetation clearance at the 30 percent, uh, at the 30 feet from away from structures, and then the remaining 70 uh, feet to get a total of a, a 100 feet. Uh, we are working on developing cost estimates and parameters, uh, and the truth of the matter is this project will be several millions of dollars. Um, uh, and it's not just the one-time uh, money, it's the ongoing maintenance. And so it, it is uh, quite a very significant endeavor. And so we've, we've talked to contractors, and uh, we um, have some meetings scheduled with CAL FIRE because they're doing a lot of vegetation uh, clearing work. Uh, we're devising a schedule and a scope of work um, uh, that will really be reflective of the amount of money that we can get into the project. Uh, we can only do what we can afford to do. Um, and we will develop uh, also an estimate for ongoing maintenance. Uh, one of the things we know uh, is that should we receive uh, revenue to uh, do significant fire mitigation, we really need to keep that up, and, and, and that is extremely important. 
Um, and, you know, if, if I go back um, and, and just talk about that $100,000 grant that we applied for but didn't receive, uh, one of the things that we know is true is that uh, it is a significant fire risk uh, to San Bruno. Uh, it is not the most significant fire risk in the state of California. And so our ability to compete for and receive grants for Crestmore Canyon on a statewide basis may be limited uh, just because of all of the uh, wildfire danger that's going on. Um, there frankly are more significant areas when we look statewide. That doesn't mean that um, the canyon is not uh, significant. And so the, the image that you have before you is a uh, image uh, of, the of the canyon with a few overlays. And so the first thing you have uh, that I wanna point out is a pink border that really shows just order of magnitude what a 30, fo 30 foot uh, buffer zone is. And what that really is is a 30 foot buffer zone uh, between structures to create that immediate area of defensible space at what we call the, the residential wildlife interface, so behind the homes and structures that surround the canyon, followed by uh, the remaining 70 uh, feet area uh, where we would attempt to do underbrush clearing, trimming limbs of the trees up to uh, six feet, really that if there is a fire, uh, hopefully to limit the spread of that fire. Um, and then the larger green area uh, throughout the rest of the canyon, uh, subject to funding, we would really hope to do uh, removal of uh, dead and diseased trees, again, clearing out uh, a lot of the um, areas that uh, pose fire danger, uh, that will pose access if there is a fire to getting uh, um, fire personnel and crews in the canyon, uh, not to mention all of the um, residential uh, complaints we get every year of residents saying, you know, we really should um, uh, clear out some of the falling trees. And so I want to talk uh, now a little bit about PG&E uh, and how that relates to this. And so um, as many people in the community know, uh, PG&E was sentenced to probation. Um, was uh, uh, the company received a criminal conviction for uh, the events surrounding uh, the 2010 uh, pipeline explosion and fire. And the company was uh, sentenced to complete 10,000 hours of community service. And that order said, um, uh, to every extent possible, uh, focused on the city of San Bruno. And so, um, not, not really connected uh, initially to this effort. Um, in May of this year, uh, staff working with PG&E uh, learned that PG&E is about um, halfway done with those 10,000 hours. Um, and uh, since that time, uh, as we sit today, pg e is about three quarters of the way done with those 10,000 court mandated hours, uh, some of which have been done in uh, San Bruno, but a significant portion, approximately 60%, uh, has been completed uh, elsewhere uh, within San Mateo County. Some for organizations that serve countywide, so San Bruno, other for organizations that um, are not directly connected to San Bruno. And so uh, city staff engaged with PG&E um, for discussions of creating a community benefit project really to dedicate those remaining community service hours uh, to the city of San Bruno, really with the goal of providing the city of San Bruno with a significant and a lasting impact and refocusing those remaining community service hours on the uh, really sort of heart of where the devastation occurred. Uh, and so those conversations happened uh, this year uh, really launching uh, in January of, t of 2019 and concluding uh, just about a month ago uh, with uh, a agreement um, with PG&E subject to court approval uh, that PG&E uh, would dedicate the balance of those community service hours to a uh, significant community benefit project in the city of San Bruno, uh, specifically for uh, the Crestmore Canyon wildfire mitigation project. And so, in October of this year, uh, this month, uh, on October 8th, actually, uh, there was a court hearing uh, that was attended by um, myself, the city manager, uh, the city attorney, Mark Zaffirano, and the mayor, uh, Rico Medina. Um, and at that court hearing, uh, the city um, uh, let the judge know of a conceptual um, proposal uh, that has been agreed to by the city and pg e whereby those remaining community service hours uh, would be dedicated for uh, this important community benefit project. Again, subject to um, uh, Judge Alsep's of, of approval, who is over the probation um, uh, order and uh, potentially even uh, subject to the pg e bankruptcy process. And so uh, th that proposal uh, was submitted to Judge Alsep and the city uh, would undertake the work. I should actually pause there 
to say that uh, when we initially had these discussions, um, the uh, original probation order uh, really called for PG&E to do community service work, and we initially thought that PG&E uh, could do this work directly um, uh, and undertake the work. Um, what we learned is that PG&E actually contracts out for all of their vegetation management uh, work that they're doing. There, there might even be significant liability issues for the city um, to have PG&E doing work on city property, and so the agreement was that the city would, uh, would undertake the work. Uh, some additional details, um, so when we uh, uh, let the judge know about our conceptual proposal, what the judge really said is where's the plan? Um, where's the detailed schedule? Where's the sco scope of work? What are the cost estimates? And so um, city staff uh, are in the process of putting that uh, all, together, all together to submit to the judge on November 12th, which is the next uh, status hearing. Uh, but it's important to note that if the $3 million is approved, uh, uh, it would uh, it could only be spent on vegetation management and fire mitigation um, in the canyon, and and that really um, uh, was sort of a clear realization um, and expression of the judge. Uh, really wanted to be sure that that money was spent on work in the canyon and not spent on the planning work and consultants, because any project of this magnitude really takes uh, some real work to get off the ground, and you have to go through the CEQA process. Uh, and the judge really wanted any significant dedication because these were um, essentially will be converted community service hours to actually go to boots on the ground, if you will. Um, and so any additional resources uh, would need to come from the city. Uh, it is city property. Um, and uh, additionally, it's important to note, I've said it before, but the ongoing maintenance uh, uh, we would need to find a way to uh, cover. And so we are preparing for the November uh, 12th hearing, uh, and what we want to, um, what we have before the city council is a resolution uh, formally establishing the Crestmore Canyon wildfire mitigation project in the 1920 budget year and appropriating 125,000 from the city's emergency disaster reserve fund. I'll pause there to note that uh, the city's emergency disaster reserve fund was set up by $3 million, uh, with $3 million because we face a lot of risks, risk from earthquakes, risk from fire, risk from infrastructure utility failures. Uh, and so one of the questions you may have is why are we pulling money from our emergency reserve fund to fund a capital project? Important to note that since that project was established with $3 million, uh, by pulling out 125,000, we are actually using the interest earnings uh, that have been accumulated. So right now, uh, the fund currently has about $3,182,000. Uh, and so in, important to note by this, by doing this allocation from the fund, we will not be sort of putting ourselves or the disaster fund at risk. We will essentially be leveraging the interest earnings that that fund has accumulated uh, to begin the planning and environmental clearance work because uh, should it be approved by the judge, uh, any significant work uh, will need to go through that process. Um, should the money not be approved by the judge, uh, we will plan for a project with whatever dollars that we can afford. Um, this is city property, um, and uh, it is uh, as the um, fire hazard assessment uh, that we have done, and that's included, it is um, uh, a extreme uh, fire hazard risk that we have, and so we, we need to plan for it, and this project is part of that. And so the, the 125000 uh will be combined with the 75000 that the uh, council allocated for this fiscal year, bringing the total project budget to 200000 uh, the city is planning some work. Um, since we did that fire, uh, the um, since we spent the 15000 last fiscal year to clear the access road, the weeds have grown back up, and we need to go in uh, and ensure that we have access, so we're planning a project to do that. Uh, but we really would uh, like to leverage the um, money uh, in this project uh, that uh, would be allocated as initial seed funding uh, to fund a larger project, and we'll uh, go before Judge Alsep uh, on November 12th with a full plan and scope of work um, for the project. Uh, we are here for any questions. Thank you. Anything uh, from City Attorney? You're good. Okay. Questions uh, from Council? Anything? Yeah. So, oh, Laura. I don't have questions, but I. Just, I mean, I can't express to the public, to staff, how important <coughs> that I know that the council um, believes that fire mitigation to the city. Um, we know it's an important piece, and we know it's something that we need to put money towards. Um, as you can see in the presentation, it's something that we've been talking about and putting money towards for the last year. So the fact that this opportunity came up where volunteer hours really aren't going towards San Bruno, 
is a perfect opportunity for us to actually use real money and to make sure that that money is earmarked for the fire mitigation. Um, I can't um, thank you enough for the work that you've done on this project. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Joanne. Marty? Yes, um, I'm also going to echo that. Um, service hours are great, but this money will, will save lives. And, and keeping that in, in focus, and it is something that needs to be done. So I, I'm in support of this and moving forward. Thank you. And, and I just wanted to say, um, after the uh, court hearing and also the, our fire chief, uh, Dave Crest, attended, um, I did that afternoon spoke to some of the families who lost their loved ones on that night in 2010 to, of course, let them know what had transpired at the court hearing, to let them know before press releases and all of that, and that is a, an establishment that the former mayor, and I believe, uh, is important to continue, so they hear it from us. Um, and those that I uh, w wish to discuss the topic uh, were in support of this. Um, they also believe that a, and I think some of my colleagues to the right that were there is, you know, these volunteer hours were to have been a, a value and a benefit to the community and to the city of San Bruno. And they went outside that parameter. There was not a report given, but then once it was established and seen, truly what was where it was going, um, it is okay and it's important. Volunteer work on every level is important. But if it is about cleaning up something, if it's about painting something, these dollars that can be utilized toward that canyon is still something today that even when I went on Crestmore Drive during the street outage to speak to a couple who live on that side of the canyon are still worried today. And they were there when that explosion happened. So this is something that is really important. Um, I also want to thank staff because uh, through the manager and fire department, you had a limited time in which to bring back this proposal. We wanted this done to bring back to the judge. And as you know, um, if you've ever been before a federal judge, which I had not, it's uh, a little unique in the sense that you can't say, I'm sorry, through the chair, I want to I question you on that. Um, you just kind of be quiet, you listen, um, and you get guidance from, from the judge. I think this is something that uh, will have great value that we know is long overdue that needs to be done. So our objective and goal with the approval of counsel is to go back to that November 12th and work to... Um, have the judge feel peace of mind, as well as the community's interest. I know one thing that he said that I differ with is that, you know, the city benefits, the victims don't. But I would have said, if I could, could have to the judge at that moment, but I wasn't, you're not allowed to talk unless spoken to, was, um, you know, the city was a victim. The whole city was a victim. Those folks that still worry about that still today, going on almost 10 years later, is a concern and a worry. And these are monies that I think those hours that are remaining will be better spent, better used, and save lives. So um, for me, I wanna again, thank staff for the short window that you had in which to bring this back, to bring it to council, to get us prepared for the next hearing with the judge. Um, any other questions or comments? Yes. To the chair, um, I just also want to make a comment that staff did coordinate and we did complete the mitigation for the fire road through the canyon. And that's actually an impressive fire road. I mean, it's not just some little narrow road. I mean, it's pretty good size. And I know that the residents in the area who have seen it, who have visi vis visibility to it, has, has been very appreciative. So thank you for that, because I think that was a huge jump start on being able to get accessible vehicles in there to fight fire. Anything else, Council? Anything to add, City Manager? All right, this is an action item. Resolution. Motion to approve the resolution, authorizing the funding. Second. second. Motion made and seconded. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Medina? Aye. Council Member Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor O'Connell? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. The motion carries. Okay, the next item.
Item 6D, receive presentation and update on the Crestmore Glenview Fire Neighborhood Reconstruction Project and adopt a resolution authorizing appropriation of $100,000 from the Capital Improvement One-Time Initiative Reserve Fund, Fund 004, to cover the costs associated with Fire Station 52 geotechnical work and authorizing $490,000 of staff time on reserve in the Emergency Disaster Recovery Fund, Fund 190, for the remaining expenditures in order to complete the project. Harry and Keith. Harry? <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, as you know, I'm Harry Burroughs and I'm the City's Project Manager for the Crestmore Reconstruction Project. The purpose of the items before you tonight um, is to provide an update on the status of the reconstruction project, as well as the overall budget and closeout of the trust. We we're here before you about a year ago, what at that time wasn't the best news. We were projecting a um, uh, budget that exceeded the um, $50 million by about $1.4 million. Uh, we have much better news for you tonight, um, generally, and that is that um, that has been reduced, that um, um, overage has shrunk to what we're estimating now to be just shy of $600,000. So um, we've got um, three items um, on the agenda this evening before the City Council. This presentation will cover all three of those. And in summary, they are the overall project um, um, summary update and um, budget update, the closeout of the Earl Glenview Park project, and an update on the phase four project status, as well as a request for a partial release of retention to the contractor on that project, who is Granite Rock Construction Company. As background, I will provide a brief overview of the trust components and expenditures, a summary of the individual reconstruction projects, and a discussion of the remaining items to complete and close out the overall project. I'm going to then turn the presentation over to um, Keith DiMartini, the finance director, to discuss strategies to cover this budget shortfall I described and an appropriations request. So the expenditures against the $50 million trust have been historically tracked in eight different um, categories. For simplicity, we've um, condensed those here to show just the primary items. And these include the reconstruction and maintenance costs, which make up a bulk of the um, budget, um, staff time, professional services related to federal and state proceedings, and those were the CPUC and the NTSB um, proceedings. And then uh, the remainder uh, are, are grouped in um, a category here that I've labeled administrative and other costs. And those include costs such as um, um, items directly related to the trust and the trustee, cost related to support of the residents immediately after um, the um, fire and explosion, including counseling and outreach. And a large portion of that is also includes a waiver of fees, mostly building fees that um, um, were required as part of the home rebuilding um, for homes that were burned down or destroyed or damaged in the um, explosion fire. The main takeaway, I think, from this slide, however, is, is the top item, and, you know, it's... Um, 70%, almost 70% of the $50 million has been or will have been spent on actual improvements um, or costs related to construction of those improvements within the neighborhood. So there have been nine separate construction projects as part of the overall neighborhood reconstruction, and all but one of these have now been completed. Um, what I'd like to do is just real briefly, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but I'd like to just um, real briefly describe each of these projects. The first was the Crestmore Canyon slope and retaining wall reconstruction, and this was in the aftermath of, of the fire, and um, Jovan's previous presentation you know, touched on this a little bit. Um, this is the upper portion of the canyon that um, suffered um, the fire um, as part of the explosion, and so this work involved reconstruction of the um, new reconstruction and new retaining walls adjacent to the homes um, that abut the canyon, as well as a slope erosion control and stabilization project that is shown here. The phase one water and sewer projects replaced an upsized critical infrastructure that serves the neighborhood. The phase two and three utility replacement project completely replaced all of the underground sewer, water, and storm drain within the neighborhood. 
The Upper Sanitary Sewer Lateral Replacement Project um, replaced over 325 sewer laterals, um, mostly Orangeburg pipe um, that was failing within the neighborhood, and this uh, greatly helped to reduce infiltration and inflow within the city sewer system. The Earl Glenview Park project replaced a former tot lot that was at the mouth or the top of the canyon um, with a new modern park complex that's now a centerpiece of the neighborhood. And then the Crestmore Canyon replanting, this um, goes back to the, the earlier slide where, where you saw the devastation of the canyon. It was originally envisioned and described early on as a reforestation project within the canyon. There used to be, many of you may remember, a very dense um, eucalyptus grove in this portion of the canyon. However, after the fire and the slopes were repaired um, over the years, um, native ground species, ground cover, and trees um, have regrown on the slopes. So therefore, the scope of this project re was reduced to the construction of a new decorative um, fence that delineates the top of the canyon, as well as some native planting, planting of native live oak trees along the top of the canyon. And then the last project, which um, we're trying to finish up, is the Phase 4 Street Improvement Project. This project has included the replacement and um, um, removal and replacement of all concrete curb gutter and sidewalk, new decorative LED street light system to replace the old unreliable RO, uh, regulated um, output system, reconstruction and repaving of all the streets, including uh, the installation of a new subdrain system beneath the new roadway. As I said, this project's nearing completion, and um, I'll discuss the remaining items that um, are needed to complete it here in just a moment. But first, I want to discuss the closeout of the Earl Glenview Park. So as many of you will remember, this project was constructed mostly during uh, the year of 2018, and we had a ribbon cutting and um, um, grand opening of the park uh, last October. There was additional work that was completed um, throughout the beginning of this year, including punch list and maintenance items on the park, and that was completed um, in early summer. The project involved seven um, change orders, which are described in great detail in the staff report, and I'm not going to go into those um, here tonight, but I did want to touch upon two of those that are of particular note because they represent work that was not originally envisioned as part of the original park project. <coughs> So as you can see, um, the bottom two photos here um, on this slide represent those two projects. And one is what the project I just described, which is the um, Crestmore Canyon landscape, which was originally envisioned as a much larger standalone project. However, after the scope was reduced, um, we decided that um, for expediency purposes and for cost savings to add it to the park project, um, as so not to go out with a separate um, construction contract. Similarly, at the end of Concord Way, which is the photo on the right, there was um, a dilapidated chain link fence as well as um, the concrete wall that's shown there was cracked and damaged. So we undertook that project as well and added it to the park um, project instead of adding it to the phase four project. It made more sense since um, fence work was included in the landscape project to do that work um, with part of the park project. So these two change orders um, actually helped push the overall budget above the total authorized construction um, budget by an amount um, of $26,090, which is shown here on the slide. In addition to the construction budget increase, the project designer, um, MIG, incurred additional fees related to the various change orders and construction coordination, um, and they ex have exceeded their budget. Their total contract was 118000 shown here on the slide, and they've exceeded their budget by $6,400. So tonight, um, we're requesting that the City Council authorize amendments to both of these contracts in the amount shown here in order to close out the park project. In addition, we're requesting that the project be accepted as complete and that final, so, such that final payments can be made and a notice of completion be filed with San Mateo County. Moving on to the phase four project, um, 
as I stated earlier, this project is essentially complete. 99% um, of the contract work, the original contract work is completed. Final um, items remaining include some punch list items, and this involves mostly interface with private properties, things um, that the contractor still has to do at the interface between the back of the new sidewalk and the existing um, homes and yards. There's some repairs of pavement in several locations um, that need to be done. It was um, caused by sub-base failures. Without getting too technical, that's the um, area beneath our new roadway that was put in. We had some soft spots that weren't identified um, during construction and, and the, the, the roadway failed after the roads were paved. We also have some adjustments to some concrete walkways that need to be made where the new um, sidewalk is slightly higher than the adjacent walkways. And uh, in order to um, uh, get rid of tripping hazards, we need to go back and fix those items. We also have some intersection striping rev revisions and the final cleanup of the yard that's been up there for many, many projects when you drive down Glenview, that we need to get that um, yard cleaned up. So those are the remaining construction items within um, the project. Most of them are um, change orders. Uh, there's very little of this work here is um, contract work. Pro only the project cleanup, the final cleanup of the yard remains as final contract work. So there's additional work as part of the overall project closeout that still needs to be done. And then those are listed here. Um, they include the preparation of final record drawings or as-builts for the project. Those are currently underway. There's also the preparation of a street monument record of survey that um, is being done. We as part of the project reconstructing the road had to remove all of the street monuments. They had to be replaced. And when they get replaced, it's a requirement of um, uh, the Subdivision Map Act that a record of survey be performed and filed with the county. That record of survey has been completed and is awaiting recordation um, at the county. Um, and we also have final project archi archiving and documentation, which is ongoing as well. So, we currently expect that all of the construction in the field will be done in early December. We had, we had hoped, and I believe the staff report um, notes that um, by mid-November. However, we just talked with our contractor in the last day or so, and the p repaving work is now not scheduled until November 18th through 20th. So um, that, that, that work still remains. So as part of the phase four project closeout, the contractor, Granite Rock Construction Company, has a request um, to get paid partial, partial, to get paid for a part of his retention that the city's withheld from the contract. So on these construction projects, the, typ the city typically withholds 5% of every progress payment that, that gets paid to the contractor. And the purpose of that is, as the project um, um, is constructed, you retain that money in case the, pro the contractor fails to perform some of the contract work. As the work is completed and you pay it out, there's less need to have that retention. In fact, the previous um, um, public contract code in previous years allowed for a reduction in retention that um, when it used to be 10%, you could reduce it down to 5%. It's now 5%. Um, the, Contractor has requested that the retention be reduced on this project for several different reasons, including this project has been um, a lengthy project, much longer than he anticipated or they anticipated. Um, they've got subcontractors that they need to get paid and they'd like to get those subcontractors paid. We've looked at, staff has looked at the remaining work, um, particularly contract work that um, is, is left to be performed. We think that the liability to the city is less than $50,000 and we're holding um, $500,000 plus in retention. So we think that uh, the release of retention, um, at least partial release of retention to $250,000 is um, reasonable and we are recommending that. And then circling back to the overall trust budget, this um, is a chart that you may be familiar with or have seen before. This, um, the categories on the left are the detail categories that are shown on the city's website when um, um, uh, the city updates the um, trust um, reimbursements. So two categories of expenses are remaining. Then they are the reconstruction and maintenance cost item as well as the um, PG&E trust and trustee cost. 
and they total a little over $1.15 million. The remaining um, budget includes some cost, so that in that $1.1 um, $1 million, $1 million um, shown there in the middle of the chart, those costs include some items that have already been paid but have not been um, submitted for um, reimbursement to the trust. So that, that's why that number might seem a little bit higher than some of the number, other numbers that you see in your staff report. It's we want to make sure we're not double counting and, and things get put in, in the right place um, um, in terms of accounting. These costs also include um, uh, several contingencies. One, we've got, as I described, some construction items remaining. I want to make sure that we have a contingency, an appropriate contingency on those in case we run into problems in the field with the paving, for example. We have to tear up the streets and do some dig outs there. If, for example, um, the areas of sub-base failure are larger than we had anticipated, I'd like to have some contingency in there as well. Um, the other minor contingency that we have placed in these numbers include a contingency for um, any uh, potential claims from residents that um, we may have to settle with. So, so those are two contingencies that are included in these numbers. But even with those contingencies, again, we're projecting a total budget shortfall of about $590,000 uh, when we were looking at um, almost $1.4 million a year ago. So at this point, I'd like to um, turn it over to Keith to um, discuss a strategy to cover the budget shortfall as well as a request for appropriation. Finance Director. Thank you, Harry. Good evening, Honorable Mayo, members of the City Council. Um, my name is Keith Tamartini. I'm the City's Finance Director. And as uh, Harry mentioned, I want to go over what the city, what staff's strategies are to address the budget shortfall um, that staff have already presented uh, regarding this project. And so before I go into um, the details of how staff are um, recommending addressing the budget shortfall, I will say that the recommendations before you this evening are consistent with the presentation that both Harry and I made about a year ago with what the, um, what, what the budget shortfall um, was projected to be. As Harry mentioned, it was approximately 1.4 million projected about a year ago. Now it's being projected at much less at $590,000. The strategies are the same, but we will not have to utilize um, the third option that was presented about a year ago, which was dipping into the emergency, in the emergency disaster reserve fund that the city manager talked about in the prior item before you this evening. We are not having to do that, which is a very good thing. And so let me go over um, the strategies that we are recommending before you this evening. Um, at a high level, the total budget for this project was $50 million, and we are projecting to come in at $50,590,000, so exceeding the budget by $590,000 in total. There are two uh, recommendations to balance the budget. First, um, is utilizing the city's general fund reserve um, fund for capital for related to fire station 52. And the second is to utilize staff costs that were already reimbursed that are currently on reserve. And so I'll go over both of those um, in detail on the next slide. So first, uh, the first item before you uh, that staff is recommending is to utilize the, the city's general fund capital improvements uh, reserve fund, that's our fund 004. And that's the fund that um, a significant amount of capital um, projects, uh, how they're implemented is, is using that fund. There currently is a capital improvement project related to um, the rebuild of Fire Station 52. Um, that's currently in the approved CIP budget. Um, it does have a carry forward appropriation of a million dollars. There was work done as part of the, uh, this rebuild project that is directly attributable to the Fire Station 52 rebuild project, such as various consulting costs, geotechnical studies, um, specific work for that project. So it is appropriate for those costs to be transferred from the, the, the rebuild project to the Fire Station 52 project. So it would be transferring those expenses from one project to the other. The second option before um, the second uh, recommend the recommended uh, budget solution is to utilize um, the staff costs that have already been reimbursed from the trustee um, to pay the cost overrun. Uh, City Council did take an action a number of years ago, which was a very uh, fiscally conservative action to put uh, $722,000 of staff costs that were reimbursed from the trustee 
on reserve in this emergency disaster recovery fund. Um, that cash sits in the fund on reserve. It cannot be used without an action in the city council. So staff is before you requesting to use the remaining $490,000 um, to cover the budget shortfall that's required. And then once the project once the project is fully complete, once all the expenses have been incurred, once all the reconciliation work has been done, staff will do one final review and reconciling um, reconciliation of the entire act, of the of the entire fund, make sure that any remaining costs have been fully addressed, and then close down the fund and the capital and project to have the project be 100% complete. It's also important to note that. Um, there really is no, there is no use of the city's general fund in any of these budget um, um, solutions. The, the $100,000 uh, on item number one, that's money that has already been provided from PG&E. And the second item as well are funds that were, that were, um, that were provided to the city from PG&E as well. So there is no specific general fund from the city that would be used or leveraged for um, executing both of these budget <coughs> solutions. So I would just like to reiterate the requests that are, that are before the city council this evening. First, please receive the presentation and update on the Crestmore Glenview Fire Neighborhood Reconstruction Project and adopt a resolution authorizing the appropriation of $100,000 from the Capital Improvement One-Time Initiative Reserve Fund to cover the costs associated with Fire Station 52 and also authorizing $490,000 of staff time on reserve in the Emergency Disaster Recovery Fund for the remaining expenditures in order to complete the project. Number two, please adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a contract amendment with elite landscape construction and the amount of $26,090 for the completion of the construction for the Earl Glenview Park and authorizing the city manager to execute a contract amendment with, with MIG Incorporated for the amount of $6,400 for the final design services for the Earl Glenview Park and accept the Earl Glenview Park as complete and authorize the filing of notice of completion with the San Mateo County Recorder's Office. And then number three, please adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to release $250,000 of project retention to Granite Rock Construction for the Crestmore Neighborhood Reconstruction Phase Four Street Improvement Project. That concludes our presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you both uh, to Harry and Keith for your presentations. Um, questions? from council and we can take them all all together all these items as far as any questions any questions from council at this time okay yeah. okay <clears throat> or we, oh, 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 we, no. okay. we we will need to have three votes yes. though for any, each of any, the resolutions cards? we have no, no speaker thank cards. you sure um Yes, it's been a long time. I, I worked with Harry when I was a, an employee here on, on, on this project, and that's how long that was. Um, and I'm sure all the residents and pretty much everybody in San Bruno wants to know that this project is said and done, and we can continue on with our lives. Um, but I am concerned um, a few things. The, the first couple ones with the cost of the design, I, I'm fine with that. That's... Um, all good for me. Um, I'm concerned about the, the retention, release, and having a final date when this project is done. Because I know in construction, things kind of get moved around and, and we are doing them a big favor and I'm being extremely just in releasing $250,000, but I understand that. Um, just that I'm concerned that they'll get that money and then they'll schedule it for November 18th and the, the project will slip. And now we're talking about January. Well, you're not going to be p likely paving in January. I haven't checked my farmer's almanac this year, so I couldn't tell you about that. But um, just schedule slippage and getting a clear, we need you to be done with this job. We're giving you a big favor of giving you a quarter of a million dollars that we don't legally need to do 
but we, I, I feel that we should have some additional assurances that we're going to get this job done this year. Um, that's my first comment. The, the second is, what is the final pavement going to look like? Because I know a lot of people don't like to see, um, nobody wants to see a paved street and then here's a patch that doesn't match it. So are, are, is there going to be some um, a slurry on a certain section? How many locations do we have to uh, repair? Um, just so that we have something that everybody could just say, wow, they're done, it looks, it looks great. We've got a new street, we pay for a new street, we don't, we, don't, we don't want patchwork, but things happen in construction. So those are my comments for now. Thank you. Um, does staff want to respond or you want me to get yes. more comments from? We'll respond, I'll have Harry do the sure. beginning part. Sure. Yeah, let me, um, let me answer both of those questions as I can. So um, in regards to the um, retention, yes, you, you're correct. Um, legally, we don't have an obligation to release that um, to them at this point in time because there's nothing in the public contract code that requires us to do so or in the city's municipal code. Um, however, given that um, the amount of retention that has been withheld is for contract work, Unfortunately, the um, work, the re pavement repair work is not contract work. It's, it's change order work um, because of the sub-base failure. Um, so it's a change in, in conditions um, technically on, on the project. But let me also say that um, we've had multiple meetings and discussions with Granite Rock. Granite Rock wants to be complete with this project as much as we want them to be complete with this project and we all want to complete this project. They, they are a very large contractor. The amount of work remaining um, for the pavement repairs is about $60,000. This is not an excuse for them, but um, what we've been told is they are busy and have been busy on other very large projects, including the airport runway repaving and 280 and 101 projects down in South Bay. They are trying to squeeze this in. Um, we've looked at weekends um, work. We typically don't like to do weekend work in the neighborhood, but given, as you pointed out, Councilmember Medina, it's the end of the year, we're getting in the rainy season, we're trying to pull every rabbit we can to get this work done. Um, they've given us this, this schedule of the 18th through the 20th. We again have reiterated, can you find a weekend between now and then? We're waiting for a response back from them on that. Yeah. Uh, and I'll just add that uh, the bulk of the contract work was done over a year ago. And uh, I would say that sort of the reason for the, the delay uh, is on a little bit of the city's part and their part. I mean, uh, as Harry mentioned, they were, uh, they did have contracts to repave uh, the, the runways at SFO and we, uh, our project admittedly took a back seat to that. Now there had been prior, prior delays on our side too. And so uh, we know that the remaining work uh, is a lot less than 250,000, so we will be still holding uh, significant retention. Uh, but right now, holding ha half over half a million dollars of retention, given all the all the delays that really can be shared on both sides, uh, we've had a lot of discussions with them and came uh, to this resolution where, by releasing this, uh, it allows them to uh, pay their subcontractors out of the, the pot of money, and we're still holding significant funds uh, to get the work done and ensure that the work is done. Uh, so we are confident that the work will get done. You know, can I sit here and promise you that it's scheduled for mid-November? It will absolutely happen in mid-November. No, I don't want to do that because I know how these things work. Uh, but as Harry said, we are all committed to sort of see this be done as soon as possible. Any other questions or comments? Michael? Uh, Laura? Go to the chair. Um, so um, the city manager made the comment that possibly some of the delays could have been on the city's part. And so I'm, I'm wondering, are there any obstacles yet remaining to complete the work? Have we removed, are we like absolutely ready to let them come in and do their thing? There no more excuses for delays. We, we are, we're, we're ready and, and final um, directions have been given. Um, so we are ready. Okay. And, um, What's the expected duration of the remaining work? So uh, again, the, um, the primary work is gonna be the paving work. The actual duration of that paving work will be um, three days. Um, it'd be a little bit disruptive to some of the 
um, neighbors adjacent to the work, but um, not disruptive to the overall neighborhood. Um, the concrete work is actually ongoing, the walkway work. They've completed um, three of those and they've got another 12 to finish. So um, the goal is that they will have all of those concrete walkways done by the time we get the pavement work done. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then if I may, I, I failed to answer one of Council Member Medina's um, questions related to the patch. Yeah, three days of paving. Sorry. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, the, the, we're not planning to do any sort of slurry seal um, on top of it. Um, we are doing a cutout and we're going to um, um, over grind so that we have a good patch. The, the roadway was just paved last year. Um, we, we believe that, um, you know, a slurry seal isn't necessary. Laura, then I read. It's, it's, this is a tough project because there's so much that went on and went on for so long. Um, I guess what I want, I'd, I'd like to see is, is staff to really have an honest conversation about this project. Um, I know that from the, the resident um, perception of the Crestmore neighborhood rebuild, it was a frustrating process. Um, cut residents were not communicated with, they were not responded to. Um, things were scheduled outside of times that, hey, we're gonna be doing this next week and next week comes and goes and then two weeks later we're doing something. Um, it went on for far too long. But I also understand the uniqueness of this project, and I understand that this has never happened to us, and I understand the complexity of a lot that was done. Um, there were promises that never were followed through with. There was promises for some sort of special uh, brickwork in the, in the intersections, and then it becomes some sort of painted, paved, painted uh, intersections. Um, I, I have friends that live in that neighborhood, and I drove through it a number of times and saw a lot of stuff that were pointed out that was they were 100% right. When you have a 70-year-old resident who's going out and sweeping up his own gravel left behind, behind by, by uh, somebody who was paving um, that day before and they're needing to feel like they can safely walk on the street or on the sidewalk, um, wasn't good. Um, and so I, I, I think I've been frustrated and I think a lot of other members of the council have been frustrated with this project. Um, but I, at the other side, there was so much that had to be done. And your pictures sort of show a lot of the work that had to be done. And in any one project, it didn't always go 100% perfect. So I know that a lot of things that happen, um, you've got a resident where you've got a brand new sidewalk and then you chip part of their pathway and unforeseeable things. Um, I just wanna make sure we move forward and we always can learn from our mistakes, right? We're not all perfect. But is there anything that we can do in a better process in making sure we get back to residents in time, making sure residents can feel like their issues are getting addressed or you know, some tickler file or something that they can see online that they can go to and know, I have that same complaint, let's put it out there. So I think we need to look, and let's hope this never ever happens again, but there are always gonna be things that are kind of big in scale that we get a lot of resident input. You can question 100 residents in this room and you're gonna have you know, 75, they're totally happy, and 25, they're gonna fill the room with a lot of their complaints, and you can never make them happy. And so, um, I know you had to listen to a lot of that, Mr. Burroughs, and um, I thank you for doing what you can do. Um, I thank staff for all the work that they had to do on this project. Um, I, I questioned a long time ago with the, um, the sloped, or the slurry, that, or the paving that was starting to slope, and saw that my, firsthand. Unforese unforeseeable, something you cannot prevent. It's, you can't, uh, um, when the earth undermines, it is, it is part of nature and that is something that happens and it's, you know, you wish it's preventable, but I know that there's not much you can do for it. Um, if you really think about the project and the cost of this project and the number that we came over, I guess, wow, right? I mean, that's, what percentage is that? I don't know, Keith, One. you know that? Name? One Less, percent. Right, so, I, you know, I, in a lot of ways, that's outstanding work, right? So I know there's been a lot of struggles. I think like all of us, we just want to get it done. We want, it, we want to just put it and can say that this is 100% done. Um, so with all of that, thank you to staff, for everybody. But let's figure out how we can learn from this and make sure that the same mistakes we don't make going forward and that we can always be better than the way we were before. Well, thank you. Well said. Thank you. Um, 
with that in mind, are you notifying the neighbors that will be affected? <laughs> and so, because we don't want to hear from them, <laughs> trust me. Yes, absolutely. Okay, how? Are you knocking on their door? Are you gonna? We, we put um, flyers, um, hand delivered flyers to them. And then most of the neighbors that are affected, after being up in the neighborhood for eight years, we know a lot of them um, fairly personal. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, where we have emails and, and phone numbers, we call them as well. Okay. Cause because none of us up here want to hear anything that happened or they didn't know or any of those things. And um, I agree with Laura, there are, there are always lessons to be learned. And I don't know if there's a formal um, mythology that you might follow or a debriefing or however you do it. But I, I, I think it would be a, um, beneficial, not just to us, but to any other city that has to go through this kind of thing. So. Sometime in the future, I know now is not it, but sometime in the future, maybe we can get that done. I would say the big lesson is beware of change orders. <laughs> uh, echoing some of my colleagues as well, you know, I, I think if this passes the resolutions that um, the, the whole neighborhood up there somehow needs to be notified of where we're at, what we have left, what a projected timeline is, I know it can't be in concrete, things happen, it could rain that, those days. But, but I want them all to know, and I do know that not everybody, as was indicated, is going to be happy. There are still outstanding items of a driveway or a walkway, and those will have to be done on one-on-one -on -one basis, but this needs to be, as we come up on another anniversary next year, of, of the remembrance of what happened. It needs to be closed, we need to move forward, we need to move on. But I think it is critical because there's a lot of documentation of things from when it happened and the outside agencies to the NTSB hearings to the uh, dealing with PG&E, evacuating both areas, bringing them all back in, uh, 300 plus from Skyline College on one day. And I think those things need to be noted somewhere. It's not to say that we want to see this again. Nobody here does in this community. But at the same time, too, there are things that have been learned that we can improve upon, or God help us, if we ever have a situation that arise, arrives, we have a resource. We have something that can assist us because the next disaster may not be where we have 400 firefighters and 200 police officers. We may, meet, we, we may be on our own for a little bit, and we need to have those tools and those lessons learned and those resources that we have. Um, so I, I would hope that we do reach out to the entire neighborhood. I know those there are specific issues, which I believe they are, you are, folks are reaching out to those individuals that have outstanding concerns, but, but that the neighborhood knows that it's not only just on the website, but we've, we've done that. I think what a commitment was made by the council back then was that we would be with you and I'll use Jim Ruane to hold your hand if need be and be there every step of the way. And I think we've tried to do that, not perfect. Um, and again, no one's ever gone through this. It was really redeveloping a whole neighborhood in this community. Um, unprecedented, what we dealt with and, and the aftermath. So um, I just want extra communication. I want people to be aware and I don't wanna hear that all of a sudden they didn't know about November, that the time, because that was another concern is wasn't told, would have moved my car, would have done this, would have done that. So as I'm hopeful, and I know hope isn't a plan, but let's make a plan that gets us to the finish line, but gets us that extra communication that ensures that the, the neighborhood knows where we are, how we're gonna end it, and how we're gonna conclude it. And I want us all to be on the same page, and I want us to have beyond the communication level that we think is okay, like just the website. I don't have the answer, but I'm looking to staff for something because I think it's, it's critical that, you know, this neighborhood went through a lot and every remembrance that I've gone to, they come forward and they remember each other, they remember those that have been lost, but the resilience and the courage of that neighborhood and what they've endured and the frustration, I want to know when, it, when it's concluded not, not, not remembering, I don't mean that in the conclusion, but this project, that we do it right. 
Any other comments or questions? Okay, so what we do have is we have um, a few resolutions. Did you have a yeah. yeah, we have a few resolutions. I know each of them have been read into the record. Thank you, uh, Melissa, and thank you, Keith. Are we able, uh, City, just to confirm, I know with the clerk we can, can we just take them all together? Since they've we all been read into the record. should do separate motions for each resolution. Yeah, there, there are three resolutions mm -hmm. in your packet. So and you I want us to keep each, each separate? Each separate, yes. just for okay. the record. So let's move on to, let's go to D. We're going to adopt the, uh, there's action to adopt the first resolution, which is the 100000 and the 490000 for staff time. And, and just before we take motion, I, I do want to thank council for the $722,000 for the council that made that decision back then, which was not to put it back in the general fund. Staff time had been paid for by the community, by our budget. Mm -hmm. And it was by action of this council, and the prior council was to say, let's put it off to the side in case there are some shortfalls. We wanna have that in reserve. Same thing that we did for $3 million that we put back into the streets throughout this community for staff time. So it was wise decisions prior councils and current councils made to make sure that it just didn't go somewhere. It was spent for the betterment of the community and the shortfall that the finance director, so we're not taking down general um, general funds. So with that, an action on... D. To the chair. Yes. I'll introduce resolution authorizing the release of the $250,000 the project retention. Are, are you starting from the bottom? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Number top, one. D, D. <laughs> So in, uh, I'd like to introduce resolution for appropriating $100,000 from the capital improvement for one-time initiative to reserve funds to cover the costs associated with the fire station 52. And authorizing 490,000 of staff time to reserve the emergency disaster recovery fund for the remaining expenditures. Second. There's a motion made second. Melissa. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Medina. Aye. Council Member Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor O'Connell. Aye. Mayor Medina. Aye. Motion carries. Next, we'll go to item E. There are uh, three bullet points for uh, adoption of a resolution and the action. I'll take it. Uh, authorizing the city, I'd like to move that we authorize the city manager to exe execute a contract amendment with Elite Landscape Construction in the amount of $26,090 for the completion of construction for the Glenview, Earl Glenview Park. And. So so, so I think keep going, keep going. Two oh, more keep, keep going. Oh, okay. Every, you want more Authorize the city manager to execute a contract amendment with MIG, et cetera, and accept that Earl Glenview Park as complete and authorizing the filing of notice of completion with the San Mateo County Recorder's Office. Second. Motion second. Melissa. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Medina. Aye. Council Member Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor O'Connell. Aye. Mayor Medina. Aye. Motion carries. Item F, resolution. In the chair, I'd like to introduce resolution authorizing the city manager to release the 250000 for the product retention to Granite Rock Construction. Second. Councilmember Davis? Aye. Councilmember Medina? Aye. Councilmember Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor O'Connell? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you all. Now we'll move on to comments from council members. I, I have comments. Michael? Have no comments. Irene. Oh, thank you. So I've been walking around a lot, and I have visited uh, Fleetwood Drive, Susan Drive, and Oakmont. And they are newly or relatively newly paved. There's not a pothole on any of them. Uh, they have the fog striping. They have the double yellow line down the middle. They have the 25 mile an hour speed uh, limit on painted on the pavement. They have the, the little flashy lights that say you're going too fast or going too slow. It's all very great. We did a great job. Unfortunately, because there are no potholes and because of all those things, people zoom up and down those, all three of those streets and probably more, but those three streets because they're long and they have those nice little inclines and all that. Um, so as I was walking, I, I, I know it's hard to judge a car speed as you're standing there, but I swear to you, those people were going way more than 25 miles an hour. So I would like to request that we revisit how to mitigate some of that speeding on those three, particularly those three streets. And I'll leave it up to staff to figure it out. 
noted, uh, and staff will uh, get back to you. Thank you. Marty? <clears throat> yes, um, I got three things. Uh, it is that time of the month for the American Le Legion monthly breakfast for this Saturday, 8.30 to 11.30. Get there early. Um, it's a great time. I also want to thank uh, Council Members Davis and Salazar for holding the uh, community event this past weekend. I think it was an excellent idea. However, however I, I suggest we take that step, that idea one step further and have open town, town halls so all council members could hear the concerns at the same time. Um, the last thing is there's been a lot of earthquakes and, and I, I think it's, it's uh, fair warnings that we all should be more prepared. I know in my household I keep on thinking I, I'm going to go get that bag and get, get everything that I need uh, to be prepared, but it just those hours don't come up. So um, I, I urge everybody to join me, you know, and, and just make yourself go ahead and do it. Um, if you go to the city's website and you, you enter earthquake, you'll see plenty of links of all kinds of things that you should, you should be doing. So let's, uh, let's be a little bit more prepared. Um, thank you. And for me, just a couple things. First, um, on uh, Marty's comment on the earthquakes, and, and he, you are right on the preparedness, uh, there was a CERT graduation Saturday which I attended, so I want to thank those that participated in that, which again was rescue and preparedness, and, and uh, those classes are available through the fire, but uh, there was a graduation from CERT, and um, a lot of good individuals had some really good uh, questions, thoughts, uh, which I sat with them for a while during their lunch and then uh, handed out their certificates with the fire at the end. Also, there was a, a car show last weekend, and the only reason I'm bringing it up is uh, it was held at St. Robert's, but it was not a St. Robert's car show. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because it was for two gentlemen who unfortunately lost their lives at the intersection of El Camino and Sneath Lane, going back to a celebration um, from a christening, is my, my understanding and they lost their lives. And so it evolved to where it became a softball tournament and then somehow it evolved into a car show. And you know, you always adapt to things. And then there was a, a gentleman, Alex Rolator, who uh, was instrumental in founding that and, and having that car show. And I remember even seeing at City Hall, five o'clock on a Friday, trying to get the last permit over down at uh, Bel Air Field. And uh, he unfortunately passed away, and they've continued that. And the reason I bring it up is because you have Mrs. Rolator, who was there, Alex's mom, who did the 50-50, and as she said, just by being there, you're a winner. But truly, that event, it was sponsored by the St. Robert's Men's Club, but truly that event was the volunteers of friends, family, and community. And that's why I point that out. I think it was very impressive to me that from, I know when I arrived at three till it was getting a little cold, but after nine, um, people that are in this audience were there. Um, and it's just the community that came out to do something. And now this fund, which supported those two gentlemen's children, now is funding other people that are in need in this community. And so that truly is about giving back, paying it forward, and about what I believe the city with the heart the city of San Bruno is all about. So I just wanted to acknowledge that because it was uh, a good event for all. And yep. um, I, I forgot to uh, make an announcement that Please. I wanted to say. Um, just a reminder that as a community preparedness uh, council liaison, I'd like to remind everybody who is not already uh, registered with smcalert.org that it is really important to be part of that, um, to receive any type of traffic alerts or um, hazards that you want to stay away from and um, be alert of any type of situation. So smcalert.org, and I encourage my uh, council members team to also share that message across to other uh, social media platforms to get, get the word out, because the more we're informed, the better we can be safe. So I think after tonight, we take away preparedness. Yes. <laughs> be prepared. Okay.
Thank you all. Thank you, staff. With that, we'll adjourn to the next regularly scheduled uh, city council meeting, which will be held right here, November the 12th at 7 o'clock at the San Bernardino Senior Center. Meeting adjourned.